Um, in the meantime, um, we will also be using two tools throughout the day to help capture all of your reflections. Um, the first is at the very end of the day, we'll do a Zoom poll. That'll just pop up in your Zoom screen, multiple choice, gives us some input as we're moving forward. Um, but the one we are excited about in particular is Mural, and you'll see those links in the chat. Um, and those will be an ongoing way, not only today, tomorrow, but over the coming week for you all to share some reflections on PCBs, um, because you all bring in a wealth of knowledge as well. And we'll be particularly interested in hearing some of your reflections on what are the barriers, what's getting in the way, um, what are some of the solutions that you're excited about and want to see other regions use, um, and what are some of the resources as we collaborate across regions that will be helpful. And so with that, we'll be walking through those tools in more detail. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand it over to Andy to set the stage for today's conversation. Um, and last thing I'll note is just that Katrina and myself are both tagged as support in, in the participants. So if you have any technical questions about either Mural or Zoom, just reach out to us and we'll get you sorted. Thanks. Good, thanks, Marielle. I appreciate it. And um, uh, yeah, welcome everybody to, I guess this is our, our inaugural session. Um, for the cross-contaminant, what we're calling ourselves is a cross-program contaminant working group. Um, let me see. Zoom. So just, just to make sure that everything's okay. So um, uh, again, this, this is, um, again, the, the introductory meeting. It's a PCB symposium of the cross-program contaminant working group. Um, and, and this started based on some conversations after a presentation. So so again, my name is Andy James to, to introduce myself. I'm from the University of Washington, Tacoma, and I work in the Puget Sound Institute. Um, and I also help manage a contaminant working group in the Puget Sound region called the called PSEM, Puget Sound Ecosystem Monitoring Program. And about six or eight months ago, we invited Greg Allen from the EPA, who will we'll pop on shortly, um, to give a presentation on some of their work. So he's from the Chesapeake region um, and gave a, 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 a really compelling uh, talk on um, uh, contaminant PCB management in their wastewater um, uh, uh, treatment systems and their, their processes. Um, and, and what that ended up doing is sparking a lot of local conversation. Um, it, it resonated, you know, it, it was, it was, the conversation was that, oh, that's interesting, and, and maybe we can do some of that and use some of that information here in the Puget Sound. Um, and so a few of us uh, got to talking, and Greg and I had some conversations, and, and we thought it might be useful to explore the idea of setting up a, a, a program where we do just that, where we, where we share information on contaminant monitoring um, to see if we can't get better at, at, at doing our jobs. And that means getting fewer contaminants in the environment. Um, and just to start off, the, the, a few of us have, have been meeting every um, uh, relatively regularly over the last few months to try to pull this together. Um, and, and I'll introduce us now. And so that's myself, uh, Andy James at the University of Washington, Tacoma. Craig Allen, he's at the, the US EPA Chesapeake Bay Office. Joel Baker is a colleague of mine at UW Tacoma Puget Sound Institute. Um, Will Hobbs from the Washington State Department of Ecology. Maria Larson, she's been, uh, um, um, she was the opening pre, uh, speaker today. So she's also another colleague at UW Tacoma Puget Sound Institute. Katrina Radich is on the phone. Um, she's from the Puget Sound Partnership and Doug Austin as well. He's from the US EPA Chesapeake Bay Office. Um, but but anyway, what we were we're talking about is is um, um, sort of reinforcing the idea that that we think we can learn a whole lot from one another, um, and so that we thought there would be value in pulling together some conversations about contaminant management. Um, we also thought since PCBs were still a a, a um, an issue in different regions that that would be a good good area to focus on. It's it's an issue that drives contaminant cleanup in a lot of areas. Um, we know quite a bit about it. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done. So that's why we sort of chose the, the PCB um, um, monitoring. Um, and, and so in these conversations, what we decided that, that there might be value in getting background information on different regions, like what, what the, the PCB issues are um, in, in Puget Sound and elsewhere. Um, and how those 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 problems were managed. So, 
I guess th there lies the, the beginning of this presentation. So, so the, the background is that most estuaries and river systems that you guys know have a contaminant problem. Um, and a lot of them have PCB problems. And, and again, the premise of this whole exercise is that we share information on programs, projects, best practices um, to improve the effectiveness so, it's, um, so that we're better at, at cleaning up um, contaminants. Um, we really want to get to the place where we're sharing practical advice where information in, 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 uh, from one region can be applied to another region. So again, we're, that we're better at our jobs. Um, and, and so what we're going to do today, start off with, is to share background and context across geographies, right? So, so we'll, uh, we've got a set of speakers today and a set of speakers tomorrow, um, focusing on six different uh, programs. And by programs, I mean estuary or, or uh, uh, rearing systems. Um, the, the second objective of today, and this is, this is really important for us, and this is what Marielle talked about, is, is we're really, really interested in getting input and feedback from you all. Uh, in terms of, of comments from, uh, you know, through chat, we've got the mural tool, we'll, we'll have some Zoom polls, but we really want to know what your thoughts are on, on the utility of carrying forward with this exercise. Uh, so the, the primary question, is there value in organizing specific and focused discussion groups, venues, and symposium? Um, and if the answer is yes, there is value in doing that, we really want to know what, what people are interested in focusing on, and, and then we would be willing to continue organizing these kind of sessions. If it turns out the answer to the first one is is um, is no, you know these these this kind of exercise is covered elsewhere, maybe in a conference or something. Then then we would be um, really satisfied sharing information on programs with you all today, and then and then we we sort of uh, go on our merry way and, and manage our contaminants in our own regions. But but the question is um, the feedback we've gotten. We think there is value, but we really want to hear hear from you all on, on what you think about that. So, so again, the, the, the two objectives of today, again, are just backing up once is to share background and context and then to get this feedback. And so hopefully we can get that from, from you all. Um, just some ideas. Again, we had some background conversations and some ideas that, that we could talk about. Um, and and I'll, I'll sort of uh, paraphrase. People were, were interested in understanding how do we use tools and authorities available to reduce impacts? Um, um, how is science and monitoring used to inform actions under those tools and authorities? Um, other people were really interested in source identification. Um, folks were interested in mitigation and management technologies, what worked, and, and also equally as important is, is what did not. Um, folks were interested in monitoring, and, and, and there were quite a few people who um, were interested in, in talking through ideas on how lessons from PCB management could be applied to other harmful and persistent compounds such as PFAS. So as you probably all will know, PFAS um, is, is an emerging issue, uh, halogenated, persistent, organic. And, and so maybe PC, lessons learned from the PCB uh, work we've been doing in the, you know, the past 40 years, uh, maybe they can help us be better at managing PFAS. So these are, these are ideas that, that, um, that people have mentioned. Again, through our sort of feedback mechanisms, we really hope to hear from you all on, on what you think about this. Um, so with that, I will hand it off to Greg, who should be on the call, and and um, and he can carry us through the rest of this present the introduction presentation. Yes, great. Thank you, Andy, and hello, and good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Great to be together today. I'm just going to say a few more things about why we chose to come together around PCBs. Uh, PCBs are not a static class of pollutants. There's active ongoing loading and cycling of PCBs in our coastal systems. And PCBs dominate our fish consumption advisories. Uh, and that's up and down the coast, uh, really. And every day people are consuming fish that contain this class of probable carcinogens. And also we have a relatively firm understanding of how PCBs behave in the environment. Uh, and in some cases, we have decades of experience with management programs that are intended to reduce bioavailable PCBs. So altogether, th this made PCBs an obvious topic for us to come together and start to collaborate on. Uh, we have an amazing set of presentations coming up in this two half-day format that we landed on 
And in the next slide, we can see a little bit about what we can expect to hear. Um, so we asked our presenters to think about their overall strategic approach in the regions that they're representing. Uh, where there is data available, we hope to see uh, some information on status and trends and things like concentrations of PCBs and fish. Uh, we want to talk about the technologies, the remedial and mitigating technologies that seem to be most promising and that are being used or planned for use. And really uh, following good adaptive management principles. We want to talk about what we've done, what has worked, uh, what hasn't worked, what we've learned from the experience of trying to manage PCBs, and then going forward, what does it uh, look like? What, what's planned? Um, how are you justifying your strategic direction? And through all of that, we hope to learn and share and, and help each other make even more effective management programs, ultimately reducing the amount of bioavailable PCBs. Uh, so we've got uh, West Coast plus Great Lakes uh, today. We've got East Coast tomorrow. Today is Puget Sound, Spokane River, and the Great Lakes. Tomorrow we'll go East Coast with Chesapeake Bay, Delaware Bay, and New Bedford Harbor. The real key to this, as Andy has already said, is the participation of everyone and sharing your, your thoughts, your own lessons learned, your recommendations and suggestions. That's how we're gonna get the most value out of our time together. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Katrina for a little more preparations for us. Thanks, Greg. And good morning, everyone. I am going to ask Andy to stop screen sharing uh, so I can screen share in a moment. But I, uh, Marielle and myself have been putting links into the chat for the mural board for the icebreaker. Um, for those who are not used to mural, mural is a great online platform. If you follow that link, you'll likely see something very similar to my screen. Um, you are more than welcome to type in your name, but you're also welcome to have an anonymous animal. In this case, mine's going to be a visiting sea lion and then click enter as a visitor. Um, for those who are not used to mural, uh, I like to describe mural as like a great platform and how we're going to utilize it today is that if we were meeting in person and you could imagine a big poster with a bunch of sticky notes, this is a great virtual way that we're gonna uh, do similar tasks and efforts. Um, so I'm gonna first, uh, for, again, for those who are not used to mural, I'm gonna note that in this bottom right-hand corner is a great way to just try to navigate, zoom in, zoom out, get the text size just the way you want it to look at. Um, so you can zoom in and zoom out and you'll see this little screen is able to also help you move around this canvas or also, again, if we were meeting in person, it's like a poster board. Um, and for today's icebreaker, it's set up to be very similar to as if we were meeting um, as if uh, for our later activities um, throughout the symposium, when we're asking for feedback and insights for you all to engage on. So that's why you see the format that you see it. And it's great to see so many different animals, names popping up. Um, we have two prompts for today's icebreaker, asking you all to think about what your favorite food is and what's your least favorite food. And you can add your notes, find a note on here. Um, you can double click it or you can click Alt on your keyboard and double click it. Um, that way you're able to add in your comments. And if we run out of stickies, Marielle and I will help take care of that and make sure that you all have enough opportunities to add in your input. So I'm gonna pause and let folks add in uh, their insights um, over the next couple of minutes. But just a couple of quick notes for folks. Um, if you are, have any troubles with uh, Mural, if you have any troubles with Zoom, Marielle has already greatly noted that um, we have myself and Marielle have great support tags in the Zoom. Just send us a quick Zoom chat. We are happy to help you all out. Um, again, this is Mural is one of our main platforms and ways that we're going to be asking you all to engage in today's um, and tomorrow's activities. Um, additionally. Uh, 
maybe not so helpful for the icebreaker, but for later when we are um, getting into the actual mural for the symposium, I wanna encourage folks to uh, be sure to add enough content and elaboration, spell out your acronyms in your responses, because we're gonna compile all of your feedback. Um, and of course, if we don't have enough context to understand where you're coming from or what your answer is trying to describe at, we are sort of at loss. So please do be sure that, to ensure that your answers are um, comprehensive, elaborative, um, enough that we can understand the context there. Okay. I'll let folks continue on in there and I'll stop screen sharing. I think that's it for my end. Again, if folks have any questions or uh, are troubleshooting, please do, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to Marielle or myself. And then I think I'll pass it to you, Andy. I'd wait, I recommend wait for folks to have a, a few more minutes to go in and add in their icebreaker. <laughs> Thanks, Katrina. Um, it, it may also be useful this um, since we have a little bit of time to to do a quick tour of the of the other feedback mural where we're actually getting the, the sort of the programmatic feedback as well, as opposed to feedback on spam and sea urchins. I mean, it's great. Um, yes, no, absolutely. I can do that right now. Uh, so folks, if you have if you're done with the icebreaker, you feel confident enough uh, navigating mural, I uh, encourage you to take a few minutes to take a look at the other mural, which is what we'll be primarily using for today. Um, again, it should look very similar to the icebreaker format. And again, encourage you all to use that zoom in and zoom out function because uh, there is a lot more meat to this mural than um, the icebreaker one. And so we have, it's uh, noted in a couple of different sections, asking barriers, um, and if, again, this is a great um, time to remind folks that please make sure your examples of your responses are great and comprehensive. If you're not quite sure what that will look like. There's some great examples um, noted in this gray stickies along the left-hand uh, column. Um, and again, <clears throat> similar to the last uh, mural, please do click Alt and double click on a sticky or just double click. It may be some finicky between um, PCs and Apple uh, products, but um, again, if you have any issues, don't hesitate to reach out. We'll also be utilizing uh, the thumbs up function, which is if you just click on this, control V, copy paste it um, and add it to, and bring it over to the stickies. That's why if you see another comment and you're like, yes, I absolutely agree or really support that, um, as a great way so that we get understanding that you don't have to repeat a comment or um, a response. Um, that thumbs up sticky does just uh, the same purpose. Oops, sorry, getting a little squirrely. Amy, um, do you mind please. showing folks while you've got it up how to turn off the, the cursor piece too? <laughs> got a couple yes. questions about that. <laughs> so, um, if you go over to your own animal, so in this case, I am a visiting rabbit. You see this on the bottom hand of your screen. Um, you may see a couple of check marks. So one is broadcasting my own cursor. So that means you all can see where I am at on a given board, um, but also to see show cursors, which means you can see everyone else's. You can start to just unclick those if, uh, if it's overwhelming to see your own cursor or to see other people's cursors. Um, and that way, your screen is a little bit more clean and um, not as distracting. Anything else? Apologies, I don't have the chat box open. Marielle, is there anything else that I should cover while I'm in here? I think that's the, the big piece. And I mean, as you will see, we've structured this to kind of have some buckets um, from regulatory management tools to funding, um, just because we recognize that those are broad themes and want to drill in a level deeper to be actionable in some of the reflections you all are sharing. Because um, as Andy and Greg highlighted, this kind of helps shape what comes next and what resources as, as a collective we may want to focus time and energy around. Great, thank you, Marielle. Um, I think the only other bucket that I do just wanna highlight for folks is that at the end of day one, so after we go through all these buckets, there is an opportunity, we have an other bucket 
Um, it's just to provide feedback, um, anything that uh, we all as steering committee um, and support team can help uh, adjust over either today and to tomorrow or any larger scale comments that you want to be sure to add um, please don't hesitate to add it into this other box um, also feel welcome um, anything smaller um, or, or related to the presentations today please feel welcome to add that in the zoom chat as well okay i think i'm close to time um andy do i pass it back to you yeah, that would be great. Um, and I'm wondering if we could share, uh, because I would like to, I'll share the, um, let's do this. I'll share the agenda real quick. Um, just so we're all, and, and I do have the uh, notion that a few people will, will sign on right at 930 for the start of the talk. And so maybe if it's possible to share the, the, the content mural link and, and the, the most recent chat, then, then we can get half folks spend a little bit of time on that in two or three minutes and then we'll hop right into the presentation. So the, the first presentation this morning is, is from Louisa Harding from Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and Rachel McRae. And so kind of queuing them up. Let's see. While folks are adding things into the mural, I'll just also add if mural feels overwhelming and this is not your jam, um, you are also welcome to to email any of us on the organizing side um, some of your reflections as well. And also the similar to that uh, email is is fantastic and and. Um, um, the chat would also be a, a useful thing, you know, so feel free to do that. Please troubleshoot my audio. Andy, for me, it's fine. Um, um, Tom, uh, one option is it may be connection on your side, in which case you can also call in from your phone for audio, which I find is sometimes a little bit more stable. I think maybe I'll just chime in here. Um, Andy, your audio from me was also started cutting in and out. And I just noticed whenever you move your head um, with your mic, <laughs> it slightly moves away. So okay. fortunately, I'm, I'm going to be transitioning away from speaking here shortly. So I'll just hold this up in front of, is that better? Perfect. Okay. And I'll just wait one or two more minutes before we start the uh, the presentation by by Louisa and Rachel this morning. And I do see some activity on the on the the mural, uh, the PCB mural. Let's call it that one, which is which is fantastic. And so um, for maybe the next minute or so, maybe uh, feel free to do that. You know, if you if you've got comments or, or just familiarize yourself. And then um, again, as as Katrina and, and Mario said, that that these will be open all day. So if you have thoughts during the presentation or or a break or whatnot, um, it'd be great to hear them. Uh,
And Louisa, how about I'll stop sharing. And if you want to share your screen, we can get uh, get you queued up, ready to go. I almost pressed the leave button instead of share. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Louisa. So there's a question in chat about um, what's the difference between the colors in mural. And, and maybe uh, Katrina or Mario can. They are more. really just personal preferences in terms of colors. Um, I would say in in the um, PCB mural, just for ease as people are going back and forth, um, we have kind of red for barriers, green for solutions, um, but that's not crucial. In if, if you end up with a different color, that is a-okay. And we'll also kind of be cleaning things up, resizing, et cetera, as it does funky things. And Bob John Johnson, uh, hi, Bob. He was wondering, is it possible to comment on what someone else has posted? Um, do you guys have a recommendation about how to, to address that? I'll maybe double check with Marielle, but I would recommend, um, so the stickies are able to drag. So if you have another comment, I would just recommend like bringing it closer to the sticky that you're trying to add a comment or connection to. Um, that is the probably the easiest way to go about it, but I'll double check with Marielle correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, I think that is probably easiest. Technically, you can also right click on the mural um, and there is an option to add a comment. Um, but I think it is probably easier to stack. I also like Heidi's suggestion of uh, adding to that particular sticky just with a different color text to note that um, it's an add-on. And a quick response to Sandy. Um, we could repost the, the link, but a little bit further up in the chat, there's um, Marielle posted a link to the, the PCB's feedback mural. So that's the second of the two links in the in the chat. And maybe you guys could repost that down at the bottom so it's, it stays active. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so let's let's um, transition to the beginning of our talks this morning. It's nine thirty, and we'll try to remain on schedule as we can. Um, so, just real briefly, um, we'll start with the Puget Sound region, um, and I'm happy to welcome Louisa Harding from Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and Rachel McRae from Washington State Department of Ecology. Um, and I'll let you guys do most of the since you have the most of the interesting stuff to say. I'll just just hand it over from there. So, Louisa. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, for the opportunity to present to you guys today. I'm really excited uh, for this conversation and this workshop. Uh, I'm gonna give a brief overview of Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife Contaminant Monitoring Program or uh, Toxics Biological Observation System. I'm gonna uh, give a brief overview of the Puget Sound Vital Science, Science and the Puget Sound Ecosystem, and then give a whirlwind tour of our status and trends of PCBs in Puget Sound biota. So um, we are the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife Toxic Biological Observation System, or TBIO. We evaluate the effects of toxic contaminants on marine and anadromous species in Puget Sound to guide efforts to protect fish and shellfish health, ensure seafood safety by providing data to the Department of Health, which then sets human health advisories for fish consumption, and to promote ecosystem recovery. Two of the primary tools we use to communicate our results and connect science to policy are the Puget Sound Vital Signs and the Stormwater Strategic Initiative. So there are 25 vital signs for Puget Sound ecosystem health and progress towards recovery goals. Um, one of those is the Toxics in Aquatic Life Vital Sign, uh, which um, we use to present our status and trends data for uh, contaminants in fish and shellfish. And then the Stormwater Strategic Initiative is one of three strategic initiatives to help guide Puget Sound recovery under the umbrella of Washington State's action agenda for Puget Sound recovery. So if the vital signs are like a blood pressure reading indicating the health of a patient, 
the implementation strategies are the treatment plan or the roadmap for how we're going to um, deal with this blood pressure reading. Throughout the talk, I'm going to refer to our vital sign recovery targets that we present in the uh, Toxic and Aquatic Life vital sign. So if you see the little, that little square, that colorful square, um, that's an indication that I'm, I'm referring to a vital sign recovery target. Okay, so now some background, just to orient those of you who are not from uh, the Puget Sound region. Um, this is along the west coast of the United States. Uh, the Salish Sea includes the inland marine and estuarine waters of British, of British Columbia and the state of Washington. It covers nearly 17,000 square kilometers and is the second largest estuary in the United States. Puget Sound refers to the southern portion of the Salish Sea within Washington. And whereas the Chesapeake Bay and San Francisco estuary are drowned river valleys, Puget Sound is a deep fjord-like system carved by glaciers about 10,000 years ago. Um, Puget Sound is home to roughly 4.5 million people, making Puget Sound one of the only highly urbanized fjord estuaries in the world. This uh, fjord-like system also results in constricted connection with the Pacific Ocean, which tends to cause hydrological and biological isolation and subsequently retain contaminants in the system. It's also a highly stratified system uh, in terms of a density gradient. So there is warmer fresh water that uh, tends to lay above colder salt water and can um, increase that hydrological isolation. Puget Sound has five uh, basins that range from relatively low development in Hood Canal to the west, uh, to high development like central Puget Sound where Seattle and Tacoma are uh, two of the major cities in the region. And then we have intermediate development in South Puget Sound and Woodby Basin. So um, within Puget Sound, PBIOS monitors toxics including PCBs in three ecosystem compartments, the nearshore food web, the benthic food web, and the pelagic food web. And we have indicator species for each of those compartments, including juvenile Chinook salmon, which re represents the riverine and um, nearshore estuarine environment. We use transplanted mussels as another indicator species in our, in our nearshore. To look at the benthic, ecosystem and food web, we, we look at English sole. And then for the pelagic, we look at Pacific herring and one of its prey species, resident Chinook salmon. Um, so, you'll, so I'll be reporting on each of these five species for our PCB uh, status and trends where available. So to start it off, I'll look at the near shore food web. And again, for orientation, this is a map of Puget Sound, and we have included impervious surface of the adjacent shoreline as a proxy for the degree of development and potential sources of contaminants like PCBs. TBIOS began monitoring PCBs using deployed bay mussels in 2012. Mussels are deployed in the winter for a period of two to three months. And the deployed bay mussels reflect uh, very local conditions. Uh, we, we believe this is on the order of hundreds of meters of shoreline rather than on a kilometers scale of sh shoreline. So uh, very, very local. And then we can see the greatest concentrations of PCBs are observed, observed in urbanized embayments like uh, the Seattle and Tacoma waterfronts and Bremerton, which is home to a naval shipyard. Um, we can also see some high PCB levels in otherwise relatively undeveloped areas. So on the, on the, on the left side above the P total PCB nanogram per gram dry weight of the legend, there's a little point that's red out there that looks like it would be a relatively, you know, uh, pristine area, but the cage is right in the port there. And so we can pick up that, that very local signal of PCBs. Uh, because, because mussels are our newest indicator, we do not yet have vital sign targets 
but we are working to, um, to implement those. So moving on to Juvenile Chinook. Uh, on the left, there is a map of the 12 river systems that have been sampled uh, between 2013 and 2018. And on the right is a box plot of the BC PCB concentrations measured in juvenile Chinook whole bodies that were sampled from each of those river systems. The diamonds on these plots show the fifth and 95th percentile for the data. And our recovery target for the Puget Sound vital signs is that 95% of the samples are below a fish health threshold of 2,400 nanograms per gram lipids. Uh, that would mean that the right-hand diamond would need to be to the left of that dashed line to be meeting our target. So the box plot and the circles on the map are color-coded so that sites meeting the target are in blue and sites not meeting the target are in orange. You can see that PCB concentrations are higher in juvenile Chinook from river systems in central and south Puget Sound, particularly the Duwamish and Puyallup rivers. Um, looking at the map, you can also see that the Duwamish and Puyallup rivers are, are those that have some of the longest extent, uh, river extent in those highly developed areas or with higher impervious surface. Um, we also know from uh, a paper by Brininger and Tillett that fish above 2200 nanograms per gram so just, just below that threshold that we have set um, may experience reduced growth and that there is an increased risk of mortality in fish above 4,800 nanogram per gram lipid PCBs. So um, we, we know that some of the fish from the Duwamish and the Puyallup are also um, expected to have increased mortality as a result of their PCB concentration. Okay. Moving on to the benthic food web. PCBs in marine sediments are greatest near urban areas, um, such as Elliott Bay, which is along the Seattle waterfront. Um, and most of the urban areas are in, in Puget Sound are local, located in the central basin. However, much of Puget Sound is much less developed. And as a result, Sediment monitoring by the Washington Department of Ecology and National Ocean Service indicate that relative to other estuaries and marine bays of the United States, Puget Sound sediments are relatively clean on a total area basis. So there might be pockets that show high levels of PCBs in sediments, but uh, overall, there's a lot of area that is, that is, that is not uh, of concern. So what do we see when we look at the English sole? So similar, similar setup to the slide with Juvenile Chinook. Um, we have 13 sites where we collect English sole throughout Puget Sound. Uh, the plot is organized roughly north to south. So on the top, you can see relatively clean, uh, low PCB levels in English sole from Strait of Georgia and Vindobi Island. Um, one, one note to make is that for this plot, the scale is on a log scale. So that's going from one nanogram per gram all the way to a thousand nanogram per gram wet weight muscle. If we add in our recovery target of eight nanograms per gram wet weight, that is a DOH screening value. So um, concentrations above eight nanogram per gram would trigger concern for um, human health for high-level consumers. You'll notice that most of the sites are above our rec recovery target threshold, um, but this is partially biased due to which sites were selected for long-term monitoring. So a, a, a large number of these sites are um, located in urban bays um, or industrialized areas. And many of them are past or present Superfund sites with known sediment contamination. If we look at the sites that are most contaminated, uh, which I've highlighted in yellow, um, they are predominantly those sites where we would expect to have high levels of PCBs 
in the sediment and therefore in the English soul. Um, in addition to the status for English soul, we also have uh, trends data. So we have conducted quantile regression to determine trends in um, the 95th percentile of PCB concentrations to help us predict when PCB concentrations in English soul fillet are likely to meet our recovery targets. Uh, we have trend data available for 10 of our sites. And I'm gonna show just two examples. Uh, but first to summarize, um, we can see, so hopefully you can see the little arrows inside those circles. Um, one of our sites is decreasing at Brebberton. Three are increasing at uh, the city of Everett, the Duwamish River, and at Eagle Harbor. And six of the sites are not changing. So first, the good news. Here is the quantile regression. So the line, rather than uh, being a, a, an indication of central tendency, but that line and the 95% confidence interval of shading is attempting to model the 95th percentile of the data. Here I've overlaid some of the PCB, uh, PCB remediation that has um, happened at this site. So we see dredging in the early 2000s, after which there was a, a little increase in the PCB concentrations in English sulfile. And then in the early 2010s, there was more in-water work. And again, we see a little, little blip, but overall we see a, a decrease after those in-water activities. And um, so now in, in 2020, uh, the concentrations of PCBs in English sulfile are about half of what they were when we started on our monitoring. In contrast, English soil from Duwamish River have the highest PCB concentrations of any of our sites, and those concentrations are currently increasing. However, there has been in-water work that may be remobilizing PCBs from the sediment and causing spikes in the concentrations, as was observed at Bremerton. So it's possible that a decline is right around the corner. Fingers crossed. Okay, so moving on to the pelagic food web. Uh, I'll be showing data from Pacific Herring, uh, followed by our uh, adult resident Chinook salmon. So whereas English full PCB concentrations reflect the scale of a bay, Herring PCB concentrations reflect the scale of an entire basin. Uh, in Puget Sound, we sampled five Herring stocks. The ellipses on the map represent our best understanding of the foraging range of the Herring from these five uh, populations. So here we see three stocks from either the Strait of Georgia or Hood Canal have relatively low PCB concentrations, whereas the herring from Central Basin and South Basin have uh, levels that are exceeding our threshold for fish health. So like with the juvenile Chinook, this threshold is a 2,400 nanogram per gram lipid weight. And we expect health impacts to the herring uh, at concentrations above that threshold. We're trying to get 95% of the samples below that threshold um, from each location. So despite spending most of their time feeding offshore in reasonably clean waters, 95% um, of the herring from Central and South Puget Sound have PCB concentrations above our, our fish health threshold. If we compare the total PCB levels in herring from Puget Sound to those along the coast, we can see that Puget Sound herring from Central and South Sound are an order of magnitude higher than all of the others. Um, similarly, when we have compared Puget Sound herring to herring PCB levels in the literature, Puget Sound herring PCB levels exceed those from the Atlantic Ocean and five Baltic Sea locations, um, some of which are from some of the most industrialized and then marine waters in the world. So Puget Sound is um, a regional hotspot and potentially a, a global hotspot for PCBs in the pelagic food web. So what about the trends? Um, as with English soil, we have some trend data for the Pacific herring. Uh, we conducted the same quantile regressions to determine trends in the 95th percentile of PCB concentrations. Uh, I'm going to just show one. Uh, this is PCB levels 
in herring from Central Basin, which were the highest levels. And we do see that the concentrations are beginning to decline. However, it's at a rate of less than 1% per year, suggesting that uh, the rate is insufficient to achieve our recovery target goals. So, uh, you know, good that it's uh, declining, but um, hopefully we can find ways to help move that needle faster. So moving on to salmon. Um, I, we talked about salmon earlier, talking about juvenile Chinook in their uh, outward migration. Um, however, salmon may be exposed to contaminants in various habitats throughout their life cycle. And whereas juvenile Chinook reflect the rivers and estuaries that they pass through during their outward migration, now we're going to look at adult Chinook. Adult Chinook put on most of their weight in marine waters, and as such, most of their contaminants reflect the marine waters that they feed and grow in and the surrounding food web. Up to one third of Puget Sound Chinook are considered resident, and that is to say that they don't um, migrate to the ocean. Instead, they grow and feed in Puget Sound, uh, where they are in closer proximity to contaminant sources. So here is the uh, current status that we have for PCBs in Puget Sound resident Chinook salmon fillet. Uh, on the map are marine areas that reflect the um, areas for recreational and commercial fishing, um, and for which uh, fish consumption advisories uh, are set. As with English Gulf Filet, our recovery target is eight nanogram per gram based on that Department of Health human health screening value. And you can see that uh, the resident Chinook salmon and in all of the locations are, are above that screening value and are well above that screening value. It's hard to find any sample that is below our screening value. Um, if we look at that in comparison to other salmon originating um, from up and down the Pacific coast, uh, at the top, the Kenai and Southeast Alaska are Alaskan samples of adult Chinook salmon. We see British Columbia, and then we see along the Washington coast, the Columbia River and um, the Oregon coast. We can see that Puget Sound Chinook salmon are three to five times more PCB contaminated than the rest. Um, Chinook salmon from Puget Sound are at high risk for PCB contamination because of their greater, greater residency in Puget Sound, their higher trophic le level, and uh, greater lifespan. Uh, so this, secondly, this is another comparison of um, Chinook salmon from Puget Sound uh, with others from British Columbia and uh, the Columbia River and California coast. Here you can see we've split out the resident Chinook salmon to show that salmon that reside more of their time in Puget Sound are even more contaminated. So you know, close, close to uh, an order of magnitude. Okay, so this PCB contamination continues all the way up the food chain to marine mammals. Seals have five times greater PCB concentrations in South Puget Sound compared to sites in North Puget Sound and the Strait of Georgia. And orca whales that spend more time feeding in Puget Sound have one and a half times higher PCBs than those feeding more along the coast. So we see this um, PCB hotspot continuing throughout the pelagic food web. So why is Puget Sound's pelagic food web so contaminated with PCBs? As we discussed earlier, the hydrology of Puget Sound is unique um, and helps to retain pollutants entering the water column. Uh, that restricted, restricted circulation and connection to the ocean, uh, the great depth, the density uh, stratification. We also see that, that pelagic biota may absorb PCBs directly from the water column and biomagnify up the food chain as is depicted in this uh, schematic. And lastly, Puget Sound's complex and deep system allows for anadromous and fully marine species to complete their life cycle in close proximity to urban watersheds and PCB sources. So they have greater access to that um, polluted prey base. So what are we 
what are we doing about this? What's next? Uh, we have begun a study to look at PCB concentrations in the surface palm to try to answer that question about the base of the pelagic food web. So um, on the left, that plot, the green lines are surface um, trawls that we conducted for surface particulate organic matter. And um, on the right is a bubble plot showing the concentrations of PCBs in that surface palm. And the range of PCB concentrations was um, in that orange dot down by the east waterway of the lower Duwamish River. It's 45 nanogram per gram, which is, it just kind of blows my mind that we're seeing such high concentrations in, uh, at the base of the food web in, in that location. Uh, and then it uh, levels off and, and goes down to a, what seems like a more reasonable 0 0.5 nanogram per gram as we head out into the main basin of Puget Sound. Um, so some conclusions, I'm, I'm almost on time it looks like. <laughs> uh, PCBs remain one of the most concerning toxic contaminants we know of in the Puget Sound, um, and they are not declining rapidly enough to meet recovery targets. PCBs in herring, English sole, ESA listed Chinook salmon and others are high enough to impair their health. PCBs in resident Chinook salmon, English sole and others are high enough to result in Department of Health consumption advisories. PCBs in southern resident killer whales are high enough to impair their health and population recovery. Benthic fish reflect local base scale sediment PCB levels uh, where we see greatest PCB concentrations in urbanized or industrialized areas, whereas the pelagic organisms reflect base and scale PCB contamination uh, and per pervasive contamination in central and south uh, Puget Sound pelagic food webs. And with that, I want to acknowledge uh, that it takes a village. So the whole T-Bios team, particularly Jim West and Sandy O'Neill, who have been uh, leading this team for the last 30 years and whose research and ideas this presentation is uh, based on, as well as our many collaborators, uh, many more than I could fit onto this slide. So uh, thank you. And hand it over to, to Rachel. Thanks so much, Louisa. You did a great job of hitting your time marker there. Uh, I'm super impressed. Um, all right. I will get started here now that we're all um, sort of in a fetal position, you know, uh, feeling, you know, hopeless or something about, you know, some of that data from Puget Sound. Um, I just want to encourage us all to get over that hopeless, overwhelming feeling. Um, and recognize that, you know, perfection is the enemy of progress, right? There's no single solution out there. Um, there's no single source that's the problem. Um, there's a, a lot of work uh, to be done and a lot of work underway. Um, I also want to acknowledge there are a lot of folks on today's, in today's meeting that are participants um, who have direct lived experience with some of the topics that I'm going to just briefly discuss today. So any one of the mentions that I make today could be um, its own topic, you know, for one of those follow-up conversations. So uh, for the participants out there, certainly if you're interested in hearing more about something, um, I'm sure that folks um, it'd be good to good to make those comments um, so that the organizers can consider what to do next. All right, let's see. So Louisa shared the um, the figure on the right, and you know I've got kind of a you know a magnifying glass on that on just that little piece up 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 at the top. You know, taking a closer look at what happens in this interface between the human built environment and the natural environment. And there's a lot more going on there. Um, so punchline, to start with the punchline, I'll end with the punchline, right? We have, whoops, why did you do that? There we go. Um, we have PCBs in use and we need to address those original source PCBs. Uh, we gotta find them and ensure and fix them and ensure that they're managed through the entire waste stream as they um, are addressed. Um, we have PCBs in sediments, and that's not just in those buried, uh, the buried or heavy sediments, um, but it's also in the lighter, smaller, 
uh, fluffier particulates that are moving readily around with tides and currents and vessel traffic. And um, we have PCBs on the move. And I loved hearing, um, uh, was it um, Greg this morning, use the term, you know, PCBs are cycling in the system. Um, they are absolutely cycling in the system. So we know that contaminated sediments move around. We know where we have high concentrations, either in a building source or in sediments, for example. Those will net export PCBs into the air. We know that then we have PCBs in air deposition, which contribute to stormwater pollution. We know we have PCBs um, in goose poop and in otter scat. And you can imagine that contributes PCBs in a, in a sort of a non-point pollution form. Um, we have PCBs present in surface water and groundwater at lower concentrations. There was a time when it was a myth, you know, that people commonly accepted that you would not find PCBs in water or you would not find PCBs in groundwater. And in fact, you can and you do find them. Um, and then we know that our treatment technologies for wastewater and stormwater, um, those technologies by and large are focused on extracting the solids um, out of that waste um, and stormwater. Um, and those solids can contain PCBs, pointing again to managing, uh, managing PCBs through the entire waste stream. Um, so I guess I skipped right over the introduction of myself. Um, so uh, my name is Rachel McRae, and I work at the Department of Ecology. I'm a section manager right now in the water quality program. But for the last 15 years, in one fashion or another, I've been working on PCBs in the Duwamish and the lower Duwamish waterway in particular. Um, so uh, I want to emphasize a handful of things that the lower Duwamish waterway has taught us about controlling PCBs. And then I'll talk about scale that up to Puget Sound. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Duwamish, um, you know, PCBs are a primary contaminant of concern in the lower Duwamish waterway Superfund site sediments. The Duwamish River is a long-standing fishing, harvesting, and cultural resource for the Muckleshoot, Suquamish, and Duwamish tribes. And by 1920, the estuary was heavily modified. The light blue in the figure on the right is before 1909. Industrial development increased, and by 1932, the Boeing Company operated three major facilities. Uh, the King County Airport was built um, in the Duwamish. Uh, more and more industry came in and, and built up around those assets. And then wartime industry began. And with wartime waste disposal practices, those practices have left us a uh, massive pollution problem. So a little overview on um, the key regulatory driver here um, in terms of cleanup projects. So cleanup projects themselves control secondary sources of PCBs. So um, cleanups were underway uh, by the turn of the century. They started up here in the Harbor Island vicinity and our uh, West Waterway and into Elliott Bay. Um, and then by 2000, efforts were well underway um, and, and really uh, getting rolling for um, addressing the contaminated sediments that are in the yellow outline, which is the Lower Duwamish Waterway Superfund site. That's a five mile stretch of river. Um, it's about 450 acres of sediments, of in-water sediments. Um, EPA agreed to take that regulatory lead for the sediment cleanup under CERCLA or Superfund. And Washington State Department of Ecology agreed to take the lead to control sources in the contributing 20,000 acres. Now, I want to say what those 20,000 acres are. Those are the acres of land surrounding the Duwamish River that discharge stormwater and combined sewer overflows to that five mile Superfund site. So, there are over, in that five mile stretch, there are over 200 private and public stormwater outfalls and about 15 municipal combined sewer outfalls. With the exception of non industrial private outfalls, um, all these discharges are regulated under the Clean Water Act, Section 402. In addition, there are over 400 confirmed or suspected contaminated sites in the contributing area to the Lower Duwamish Waterway. Federal and state cleanup laws are being actively used to address the contaminated soil, contaminated groundwater at high priority shoreline sites, uh, the bulk of which are shown on the figure on the right. Um, so about 30, 30 of them are shown on this figure and they represent the highest priority formal cleanup projects 
uh, underway in the lower Duwamish Basin. Um, so sediment cleanup needs to happen. It takes time, but it's worth it. Um, and I appreciate Louisa pointing out in, um, I think it was the English soul data where you have, you know, when you, when you do some of that in water work, that dredging work, there is a little increase afterwards of PCB concentration. So let's um, explain a little bit where we're at with the Duwamish cleanup. Um, so by 2015, there were five early action cleanups that were substantially completed that involved dredging and capping and upland shoreline excavation to remove contaminated soils. I know there are people on this call who are very, very, very familiar with all that work. Um, but collectively, those early action cleanups addressed about 29 acres of the most contaminated sediments in the waterway. They removed about 280,000 cubic yards of contaminated sediments and were projected to reduce surface sediment concentrations of PCBs by about 50% in the system. In addition to the early actions, um, EPA published the record of decision, the cleanup de decision document in 2014. It describes the final remedy, uh, which is really that patchwork of dredging, capping, and natural recovery. Natural recovery is where lesser contaminated sediments from upriver cover up the more contaminated sediment left behind. Um, it's a, uh, one of those technologies or techniques for sediment cleanup. Um, so uh, at this time, the parties are well underway in designing the river-wide cleanup or the waterway-wide cleanup uh, for the upper third of the five miles. Um, that work involves diligent sampling to inform detailed designs, lots of negotiations, um, and ongoing evaluations of source control progress. Um, it's another 15 to 20 years of work ahead before the sediment remedies are entirely all implemented. And that pathway of the sediments um, to the gift that keeps on giving of PCBs in the sediments, um, it'll take that long for that pathway to be intercepted as planned. So we have also um, experienced and done a lot of source tracing um, in the Duwamish. And um, we learned that the common techniques that are out there for tracking down sources in a storm system or in the, in the sewer system are useful when they're coupled with PCB knowledge and PCB chemical analysis. So um, all of the common tools listed here are things that uh, the Duwamish team has done. Um, a lot of this work was done largely by the city of Seattle, um, but uh, others, others have, have played their roles as well. So um, we review historical records. Department of Ecology uh, in the early days of the Lower Duwamish Waterway cleanup um, uh, did this historical records review for the entire Lower Duwamish area. And it re resulted in a whole series of you know, um, action plans and data gaps reports and action items and things that have really formed the foundation of the priorities that have been conducted and completed for the last 20 years. Um, but historical records, very key to, to review. Um, then you want to sample, you also want to sample PCBs in storm system solids and street dirt. So it's easier to find PCBs in solids and it's a cheaper laboratory analysis you know, kind of cheaper collection and all of that, right, to get that um, solid sample. Um, so it allows you to take more samples if um, given a given a, a limited budget. Um, catch basin solids can show a local signature of a source, but they're not a good representation of what is actually discharged to the river. Um, and then we have in, in pipe sediment traps. Um, and those collect solids that are more representative of what's discharged to the river, but the first models of sediment traps only worked in the really large pipes. Um, you can do inline sediment tra uh, sampling, inline sampling of crud in the pipes for tracking down sources. Uh, you inspect businesses at times can sample there or not, um, depending on what you're finding. Um, whether you find something or not, it's often a great idea to clean your pipes. Uh, so you have a fresh start and then resample. Did you find the only source or are there more sources out there? 
uh, clean and resample is really critical. And then to test materials and products to actually track down that uh, where the PCB was applied or where, where it got released. Um, it can be difficult to get permission to take a chunk of someone's building, like paint or caulk off of a building. Um, and so we looked for new tools. And two of the new tools that um, were largely funded by Ecology and largely developed by the city of Seattle um, was a smaller sediment trap for smaller pipes and the PCB detection dog. Um, so PCB detection dog, um, Seattle worked with the conservation canines at the UW Center for Conservation Biology under an ecology stormwater grant to determine whether or not a detection dog can aid in tracing PCBs. Um, so in this slide, you can see the photo of the handler in Samson the dog. Um, that photo is, um, Samson was the first trained PCB sniffing dog. And, and in that photo, it was essentially detecting a 500 part per million paint on that five by five gray painted concrete ta uh, tank foundation. Um, but after bench and field testing, Samson was trained to recognize the odor of Ericlor 1254 and 1260 at 0.1 mil mil uh, milligrams per kilogram and one milligram per kilogram. Um, I think that there was uh, at least one, if not two more dogs trained on that. And um, it basically is proof of concept. Yes, you can train a dog and frankly a human to uh, smell, smell uh, PCBs. So what were some of the sources that we found? Very similar to sources that have been found in other watersheds across the nation. Um, it, uh, and it ranges, you know, wide range of, of industries and properties. Um, so one of the first finds was the paint on the old Rainier Brewery property. Um, you can see it in this picture here encapsulated and below it in its uh, crazy paint colors. Um, so this was referred um, to TOSCA, to the Toxic Substances Control Act, EPA administers um, for formal remedial oversight. and. Um, and I think efforts to fully abate this property, um, uh, this PCB source continue. Um, just for context, um, uh, the samples, for example, that, that led toward identifying this building, 12 uh, milligrams per kilogram in on-site catch basin solids, seven milligrams per kilogram in the solids in the adjacent stormwater system. Another early find was the fairly widespread use of PCBs in caulk for buildings and pavement at Boeing properties. PCB joint compound removal projects began in 2002 with the removal of PCB containing concrete joint materials at a couple of Boeing's facilities. Um, this is also where we learned that PCBs migrate into the surrounding concrete. Um, They've done additional PCB characterization and abatement in other large buildings, including some large demolitions. Um, they've also done um, excavation and remediation of uh, PCB contaminated soil. Um, so so I, I say that to say these are some of our early finds and, um, and you can see that businesses can also use the same tools to track down where they might have uh, PCBs on private property. Um, you know, in terms of the industries, the waste industry um, also is, um, you know, a place where you will find PCBs. So whether it's the metal recyclers, the brick recyclers, transformer dismantling, um, you will find PCBs associated with those industries as well. All right. Um, so when we have PCBs in higher concentrations or where we have them persistently uh, at actionable levels, stormwater treatment is a valuable tool. So a lot of stormwater treatment has actually gone in in the Duwamish area in the last decade, um, and those reduce uh, PCBs as well as uh, total suspended solids and metals because it's acting on the solids, the treatment technology is acting on the solids. Um, and, um, but treatment, you know, can only do so much. Um, since it's stormwater, we also have to think about, you can't stop the rain. So stormwater will all always come. Um, and you have to have a system that works for small storms and for large storms alike. 
Uh, so um, it has to be functional, you know, with the variation that our storms um, have here in Western Washington. So it's really best to pair treatment with BMPs to continually find and fix or minimize PCB sources. The PCB management practices listed here on this slide have all been implemented in the lower Duwamish waterway context. There are some of examples where some of these have also been implemented elsewhere in Puget Sound. Um, and, and essentially, the Department of Ecology, you know, in terms of our per, uh, my work directly, you know, we use a combination of permit requirements and administrative orders to compel implementation of stormwater BMPs for PCBs. Um, these BMPs take, uh, for PCBs, take many forms and they function at many scales. So municipal systems seek to find and require property specific fixes while the municipalities are operating and maintaining their municipal systems to reduce pollutants of all kinds. Um, data collection informs adaptive management and, and really we can't be afraid to collect the data. And we can't stigmatize, we can't afford to stigmatize the finding of PCBs. Um, it will take collaboration with EPA to address PCB sources under TSCA. And recognizing that this can take time, we also need to minimize the PCB release to the environment. Um, so it'll take the expansion of the application of pollutant minimization plans um, to many properties uh, in order to, to methodically get at uh, finding and fixing sources. And it will take additional controls during building renovation and demolition where PCBs are known or suspected in building materials. So how do we scale this up to Puget Sound? Well, sediment cleanups are already scaled up. Um, so the Department of Ecology, um, Ecology's Toxics Cleanup Program um, created teams by about 2007 um, to tackle uh, Puget Sound Bay sediment cleanups. Um, so that Bay approach, Bay-wide approach, um, guides their work um, and results in cleanups that are coordinated across a bay. And often there's multiple sites um, but uh, the bay itself has a coordinated cleanup. Um, any, uh, and so you can see the figure on the right, this, these are the formal uh, first um, set of seven, I think it is, cleanups that the Ecology's Toxics Cleanup Program had targeted. Um, um, I understand about half of these projects are done or well underway. Um, and the toxic cleanup program will be looking at, you know, what are the next, the next set of, of um, bay projects or sites, sediment sites to tackle. Um, and then not shown on the figure are the EPA overseen sites. So, you know, in Washington state, we have the Model Toxics Control Act as a cleanup law um, for state authority. EPA uses you know, uh, Superfund, for example, or the, um, uh, or CERCLA. Um, and these sites listed here are the tier one sites that are um, under EPA oversight for cleanup. They correlate to some of the locations that Luisa's presentation included. Um, I won't, uh, some of these graphics you will have seen. Um, and so what I'll emphasize on this slide is that we really have a, great opportunity with the National Estuary Program in Puget Sound. It brings funds and priorities that really should have synergies with the steps that regulators are taking um, in order to tackle uh, the PCB problem. Um, and not shown here, you know, the new um, Office of Puget Sound um, at the EPA Region 10 um, presents an opportunity for that federal family. Um, so all the different agency as well as the different divisions or departments within an agency um, it allows that federal family um, to figure out how to join together um, to support Puget Sound recovery and um, including the control of PCBs that are cycling in the system. So um, uh, looking forward to that uh, Office of Puget Sound uh, forming up in the federal family and, and how to collaborate with them um, as we move forward. 
Um, and, you know, um, with respect to the way the Puget Sound Partnership and the vital signs um, and implementation strategies and all that sort of roll up together, um, I'll just emphasize that, you know, it, it um, there are uh, the toxics in fish, for example, it recognizes PCBs as an ongoing threat to Puget Sound, and it calls for removal of sources, finding hotspots, fixing hotspots. It calls for all the things that we know need to be done. Um, so there's this great opportunity. It sets up um, projects basically that could be funded um, through the National Estuary Program. Um, and hopefully it will help us all normalize um, the finding and expeditious fixing of sources of PCBs, um, including PCBs in building materials. Oops, I didn't realize this was a... Um, so one of the first projects that we're tackling um, through the NEP funding, um, but at the Department of Ecology is the PCBs in building materials project. Um, we're using NEP funds to address this source of um, PCBs in the environment. Um, so having a publication like this and doing the work to support the PCBs in building materials project helps bust the myth that somehow PCBs are banned and they're not around anymore. They're absolutely around. They're absolutely in, the, um, in our built environment and they are gifts that keep on giving. Um, this is not a Seattle only problem. Uh, PCBs have certainly been find in, found in building materials all across Western Washington. Um, and I would say, you know, where like Luisa's slide that has, you know, a, a one off red dot of where um, uh, some of the higher concentrations, I think that was in the resident Chinook, um, you know, there's probably, there's a dribble of PCBs coming from all of the built environment, more likely than not all across Puget Sound. Um, the mass of PCBs still in use is much larger than the PCBs currently in the environment. So if we don't remove them, they will continue to enter the sound. Buildings built or, or renovated between 1929 and 1980, especially industrial and commercial sources structures, um, could contain PCBs. Um, open sources of PCBs are those gifts that keep on giving to the environment. They're giving to the air, they're giving to surrounding soils, and they're giving to the storm system. Um, this project is a cross-program effort at Ecology that's led by our Hazardous Waste and Toxics Reduction Program with technical input from the Water Quality Program and the Toxics Cleanup Program, collaboration with EPA and outside parties. Um, the purpose of this project is to um, develop guidance for property owners, developers, and contractors to identify, characterize, and abate sources of PCBs in exterior building materials when planning, building renovation, or demolition. Um, this guidance was published in October last year and will form a foundation reference, uh, referenceable, citable guidance for regulatory use as well as voluntary use. Uh, the project also generated a tool to estimate the costs of characterizing and abating PCB sources. And um, we're using, the water quality program is using the project as an opportunity to um, identify and build in stormwater best management practices into our stormwater management manuals. Um, the team is working on a final deliverable that will include some potential next steps and maybe recommendations um, to kind of continue to, to uh, take more PCB source reduction actions. So I'll toss out a couple of probing thoughts for, for contemplation for another time. Um, for example, what would it take to develop a PCBs in building materials abatement program that was wide was as widely recognized as um, as lead paint as the lead paint program, for example. Um, are there legal strategies for the Federal Toxic Substances Control Act compliance that will remove barriers and create a safe harbor for property owners who deal with the problem? Uh, and and what's the best way to address PCB sources that are less than fifty parts per million? With some probing thoughts for. Uh, the next phases of PCBs in building materials. 
So uh, just a couple more slides, I'm almost done. Um, uh, looking back, right, lots of work. This is just a, a little sprinkling of some of the PCB focused efforts um, that, that have happened in Washington over the last decade. And, um, you know, we could have a whole conversation about any one of these on the list. So I'll, uh, I'll just focus on looking forward. So a few things that are um, on the horizon here. Ecology is developing a statewide ambient PCB monitoring network using funds provided by the legislature from the Monsanto settlement that the state reached with the company. That's um, being developed now, that ambient monitoring network. Um, we will continue to expand guidance for PCB control actions through standalone documents like that PCBs in building materials project or through incorporating it into existing guidance like our stormwater management manuals. Um, we have put out some PCB specific municipal stormwater permit requirements for preliminary review. Uh, so looking for ways to incorporate PCB specific source control into permits in a programmatic fashion. Um, we'll see more pollutant minimization plans and best practices in permits over time. Um, then we know there's a potential new analytical method for PCBs. I think it's method 1628 that EPA might be considering or might in, consider in the future under part 136 of the Clean Water Act. And then, you know, coming back to the Duwamish, lots of work underway there um, in terms of sediment cleanup, but we also have our ongoing project to develop a linked watershed receiving water and food web model for the green Duwamish watershed to inform, you know, what's next after the sediment cleanup. Lots of work underway. So in closing, we know PCBs are in use and we need to uh, address those original sources and it backed out. All right, I'll just wrap it that way. Um, so we know we need to address those original source PCBs. We know we need to get the sediments cleaned up in our plans and uh, we need to intercept those PCBs as they cycle wherever we can. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Rachel and Louisa for your guys' presentations. Um, yeah, quite appreciate that. Um, we, there were a few questions in the chat that I should, should bring up now, and I think some of them have been partially addressed. Um, there was some, some questions about um, source tracing methodologies, and I think that maybe was specifically to the dog. Um, and so the question was whether there's publications or resources available on that. And, and it looks like some, some King County resources have been, been put up. There were some questions about the specific of residency of Chinook salmon versus non-resident, and, and maybe it's worth, um, um, Louisa, maybe it's worth just describing that in a, a wee bit more detail so so folks, um, so that's more clear. Yeah, do you mind if I, I reshare? Certainly, go ahead. Just to help. Okay. Sorry, one second. Okay, so residency is a natural phenomenon, not just um, from hatchery practices. Uh, the fish that are in represented in this plot are our status plot. They are, are collected in the winter when we would not expect um, returning adults. So these are considered all resident uh, Chinook. So no ocean migrants would be included in this. I'm hoping Sandy will chime in if I <laughs> if I misspeak. Uh, however, in the in the next slide, where we looked at comparisons with across other populations, these these would include ocean migrants, and and this green bar for Puget Sound includes ocean migrants, whereas the white is specifically calling out those resident Chinook. Hopefully that helps. Yes, the only this is Sandy. The only thing I would add is that all of the adult salmon that are coming back to spawn were sexually mature, whereas the residents were not sexually mature, which is why another reason we knew they were residents. Good, thank you. So, yeah, so hopefully that, that clarifies the, the the question about residents. Um, there's there's another question in chat that I'll I'll take a stab at interpreting. 
Um, and, and it's about um, spending resources and effort on areas that, that may not have information or, or data to support that, the, that those efforts are needed. So, so maybe the, the, the question, my interpretation of the question, and, and um, Jason, if I get this wrong, please help me clarify, but um, wondering if, if maybe there's ways to get regulatory flexibility where focus of the, of the contaminant problem is on, is on source, like, like previously identified contaminated areas. Like, is it is it a universal requirement to to apply NPDES actions across the board, or can we get um, um, more nuanced approaches to that? Yeah. And I think you know, really, where Jason, you know, will want to take that comment and that conversation is back into the the permit development process, right? Um, because there's a process involved, and we were out for a preliminary comment. There will be formal comments. All of that is great feedback you know for that regulatory process um with respect to just kind of for today you know by and large right of course you're going to focus on um where you know you have a problem right so so we do you do need to back it up right so where do you have the fish consumption advisory where are there these challenges in the fish um and in the ecosystem i think luisa just showed us Mm, there's actually quite a bit of it out there, um, you know, depending on which biota you're looking at. Um, and so, so on the one hand, yes, of course, we're you're you're chasing um, chasing to find solutions where you know you have problems. But I will also emphasize that PCBs are unlike other contaminants. Um, you know, you don't know they're there, and um, and so if you don't know they're there, you wouldn't know that there's a source to control um, that's actually like low hanging fruit source that can, can, can be controlled. So um, you gotta come at it from that standpoint, right? There's a balance. Some of it is, you know, you go after where you know you have the problems and sometimes you just need to survey to see where else do I have problems? So uh, that's a broad way to answer or address that theme, I think, Jason. Thank you guys for that. Um, I realize that we're, we're at time again. It, um, I appreciate the presentations by by you both. Um, if you have more questions, please do put them in the in the chat and, and we'll pass them along. So we're, we're sort of preserving the chat to, to get input um, on how we move forward. Uh, so I'm going to pass it off to Will Hobbs from Ecology Now, and, and he'll introduce the next set of speakers. So thank you. Thanks, Andy. Uh, thanks, Louise and Rachel, for uh, a couple of great talks there. Um, I'm Will Hobbs. I'm with uh, Washington State Department of Ecology. I'm in our monitoring and assessment group, um, and I'm also one of the co-conspirators behind this um, two-day symposium. Um, thanks, everyone, for logging into this. Um, we're going to take our next case study and uh, move a little further east in Washington State. Uh, crossing over the, the Cascade Mountains to the Spokane River. Um, Spokane River flows out of um, the, the Washington-Idaho border, out of Lake Coeur d'Alene, um, and it's part of the Columbia River um, Basin. It's a major tributary to the Columbia River. Um, you know, like any major river that flows through an industrial center, uh, the city of Spokane, which is Washington's third largest city, um, it also has um, some issues with PCB contamination. Um, and we have two speakers um, joining us to talk about uh, the Spokane today. Um, Adrian Borges, who is with Washington State Department of Ecology. Um, she's a section manager with the Eastern Region Office. She's been with us since 2012, about the same time that I have. Um, prior to that, um, she worked in industry, um, tribal, um, uh, tribal issues as well as um, consulting um, and has been a hazardous waste manager for quite some time. Um, so Adrian's going to provide, I think, our first talk. We're going to reverse the order for the Spokane. We're going to tackle some of the regulatory perspectives first. And then David Dilks of Limnotech, uh, based out of Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, is going to cover our status and trends for the Spokane. Uh, Dave has uh, a wealth of experience with PCB issues. He's been um, working on water quality studies for 42 years. He's um, 
He's been the lead for a group called the Spokane River Toxics Task Force, which we're going to hear a lot more about. Um, sorry, the lead consultant for that group, handling all the, the, the technical issues. So thanks to both Adrian and David for joining us. And with that, I'm going to hand it to Adrian to begin our tour of uh, the Spokane River. Right, thank you. Let me get my screen up here. Okay, you should be able to see screen two there. Can you see it? Not yet. Well, how come it worked this morning? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try this. Can you see it now? Well, that's fascinating because it worked when we tried it earlier today. No, still not out. Uh, let's go back, try this again. Share screen. There we go. Now, can you see it? No. What is going on? Will you have it on your computer as well as a backup? I do. Hey, Jane, yeah. do you want me to try and bring it up? Yeah, I guess so. That really sucks because <laughs> it worked earlier. It did. <laughs> I can confirm. Yeah. And it looks like you still have all the, the presentation. Okay. Let me try removing you as a co-host and making you co-host again, Adrian, and see if that yeah. makes Zoom cooperate. All right, well, one more time. Screen disabled. Now it says disabled. Yep. So I removed and reset to so try again. Okay. I do not know what's happening here because this is. Share, let's try that. Hey, oh, there we, hey, here we go. Success. There's a little button. There's a little button that says share. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so now I've got a little thing here. All right, now we're rolling. Beautiful. There we go. Looks great. Thank you. Thank you for your help. Okay. Well, um, so so we heard about a big a big uh, water system there, the Puget Sound, and we're gonna go to the complete different extreme of a fairly small river in a larger watershed. And I'm gonna talk about the collaborative aspects, the regulatory aspects, and then David will share with you the technical work. And I will say right now that any one of these presentations today could be a whole day's worth of discussion. So there is a lot of, of things that we know and we found out and a lot of sharing that can happen. So I appreciate the opportunity to give everybody just a taste, just a taste of, of what we do. So what is a watershed? Quite simply, it's a natural feature that binds us together, creates a focus for common action. It crosses political boundaries and it flows above and below ground and it links us ecologically, economically, and culturally. I want to get back to get my cursor here so I can operate my good grief. Sorry, I have an issue here with my um you can try um, the arrows too on your um keyboard sometimes. Sorry. So you can try the arrows on your keyboard. Yeah, I'm looking for my notes here. That's the problem. So cursor needs to come back to screen one. It's not doing it. Okay, well, we're just going to wing it here. So anyway, there's many reasons why at Ecology we work from a watershed perspective, and one's quite obvious. There's a natural connectedness that, that occurs. And um, people in general, uh, they, they work, you know, out of their own geography and they're familiar with their own geography and they want to protect the things that they protect. Let's see here. So I'm going to talk about the Spokane River specifically. And as Will said, it's on the east side of the state. The watershed uh, starts in Idaho mostly and um, goes, and this picture goes here, goes from 
the right side to the left. So it um, extends from the basically the Spokane River extends basically from Lake Coeur d'Alene to the Columbia River on the left. And to the north, you'll see Lake Pont Array. This is significant because Pont Array actually supplies groundwater. The Spokane River is intimately connected with uh, the groundwater in the Spokane Valley Aquifer. And it's a sole source drinking water supply for uh, about a half a million people. As we travel down through the river, it interacts with that aquifer. At times, it's a losing reach. Uh, water goes into the aquifer. At times, it's a gaining reach. And by the time it reaches the Columbia River on the left hand of the side of this picture, uh, all of the water from the aquifer has um, has gone into into surfaced into the water into the river. So. Here is an aerial view, a satellite view of the same system. And you can see that it is quite urbanized, especially in the center. That is the city of Spokane. Along the way from the Lake Coeur d'Alene on the right to Lake Spokane, which is on the left, the river passes through seven dams, three cities. And uh, this is a slide here of the um, dischargers along that river. So there are seven. The yellow dots are the municipal dischargers and the red dots are the industrial dischargers. So let's fly over Spokane. We see this big, beautiful green area. At one time, this was all a railroad yard. It was highly industrial. It's now a park. It's been developed. Um, in the early 1900s, this whole area was industrial because there was a waterfall here and it provided water power for a lot of, uh, of the early industry. In 1974, there was a World's Fair. There was an urban renewal. A lot of the industrial materials, they might actually still be there, some of them, but basically was cleaned up, right? And uh, the train yards were removed and pavilions were built. And um, it's now, you know, still today, Spokane is a rail center. It's an artery for BNSF, for Union Pacific, for Amtrak, all of the oil and coal shipments uh, from Bakken Fuels, for example, come through Spokane. And the waterfalls here are significant um, after the... Um, after the expo was developed, this area became significant from the perspective of a, a tourist draw and a cultural center for the current Spokane. It's also a cultural center for the uh, Indian tribes. Uh, before dams were built, before hydroelectric cutoff access, salmon would come up to this area, very large salmon. They would congregate at these falls. And the tribes would congregate here too. They would meet, they would fish, they would preserve the fish. Um, and so this is a sacred site for the native tribes. You only have to go about a mile down from these falls to see something like this. Here, um, we're on a raft, it feels like wilderness. But the reality is, this is the middle of Spokane. So it's a very important recreational um, water body for us. It's also an important water body today, even for uh, our economic engine. We have uh, several um, businesses on the Spokane River, Inland Empire Paper, Kaiser Aluminum, et cetera, who have uh, permits on the river. So what's the problem? Well, quite simply, the problem, and this was in 2012, and it still is today, the Spokane River does not meet the water quality standards for PCBs. Those standards have changed a number of times since I started working at Ecology. In 2010, they were at 170 parts per quadrillion. They went to seven at one point, went and they're back at, um, then they went back to 170 and now they're back at seven again. And the Spokane tribe, which is downstream of uh, Spokane, the water quality standard for Spokane Tribe is uh, at one part per quadrillion. 
it's a small number, right? That one part per quadrillion, no matter what you do. And the real challenge that we have is in trying to find ways to um, sample, analyze, find sources, find the technologies we need to, to get there. So to better help understand this regulatory context, this is very quick, Clean Water Act 101, right? States set standards, they assess the waters. Listed waters are waters that don't meet those standards. And when waters are listed, a TMDL is required. And um, implementation can happen, right? Either pre-TMDL or post-TMDL. And that was really the value proposition for the Spokane River Task Force. The direct to implementation approach was an, was an idea that was put forth um, to not necessarily replace a TMDL, but shorten the time needed to achieve water quality standards. And that has been um, that has been challenged in Spokane, and I'll talk about that in a minute in terms of where we're going from here. But for 10 years, the uh, Spokane River Regional Toxics Task Force has been in existence uh, trying to address uh, sources of PCBs. So this is a slide that shows some of the early participants of the task force. It came about after about 20 years of litigation and contentiousness over another TMDL, the dissolved oxygen TMDL in the Spokane River. And at that time, the community believed that they didn't want to go through that again. And they thought that um, addressing PCBs in a collaborative manner was a better solution. And so there was a lot of shuttle diplomacy that was put together and a memorandum of agreement was developed. There were two key points in that memorandum of agreement. And one was that the, um, the task force would develop a comprehensive plan for finding and reducing PCBs. And the other one was that ecology would do a measurable progress evaluation. And if we weren't making measurable progress towards getting to water quality standards, then it calls you to be obligated to take a regulatory action such as a TMDL. This slide is not everybody who's <laughs> in the task force. They have some have come and gone. And uh, these are primarily the Washington participants. There are some who sit as an, just come and attend regularly. So for example, Avista comes and attends regular, regularly, but has not signed the MOA. There's a city in Idaho that has signed, City of Coeur d'Alene has signed the MOA. And we had some environmental groups that uh, originally participated, a river keeper, for example. We had also had the Spokane tribe originally participated and they dropped out because they really wanted ecology to do a TMDL and they felt that this process wasn't serving that purpose. So uh, I am a big fan of, of uh, collaboration. I want to share some observations. And unfortunately, I don't have all my notes here, so I'm just going from memory. But I just would like to say that, um, you know, for me, the, that what happened with the task force was really an example of how these principles of collaboration really work. Um, I liken it to uh, Tower of Marbles. We had a lot of things going on, um, and, there, and there are forces that stick those things together. Um, and it's easy to, and see to marble or two. In Spokane, I think the force that stuck people together was that idea that there was a purpose and that it, that um, one of those purposes was to work together. The task force was self-defined. It was voluntary and it has been respectful. And there's an accountability piece that ecology has and all that. One of the, um, oh, just lost my train of thought there. But uh, anyway, so the task force is, is defined in this MOA and the MOA describes all of these different things that need to happen in order for it to, to, to work. And even though there are times when it's rough, mostly for the most part, the task force has been highly successful and uh, and one of the things that happened when all these creative people got together was there's a whole bunch of moving pieces. So, you know, it gets complicated pretty quickly when you put everything together in a big box and you try to find which thing it is that works best. 
Um, there was a comment earlier about shouldn't you just work where the problem is and how do you be cost effective with all of your resources? That's certainly true. And so part of that exercise for the task force was to do a comprehensive plan and look at the different factors that might help decide what actions and what best management practices could be taken on. So I wanna make one point here that all of this requires out of the box thinking. I'm in the water quality program. We're tasked with doing certain things. We're tasked with doing TMDLs. We're tasked with doing permits. And I will say that those are good tools, but they're very limited. We can only go so far with those regulatory tools. We can only go so far with the Clean Water Act. We do need to address PCBs and toxics. And the way to address them is to think out of the box and primarily to think about what do we need to do to keep those materials out of the consumer supply chain, what do we need to do to keep them out of the environment? And so common wisdom would say then that it would make more sense to invest at the top of this box than to invest at the bottom of the box because it is far more effective to avoid the pollution than it is to try to clean it up afterwards. So when the comprehensive plan was uh, put together, there was a lot of thought into how to do that. And um, Dave Dilks was very instrumental in, in guiding us through this process. We looked at PCBs, we looked at their sources, we looked at pathways and created a, a large matrix for evaluation. This table here is a, a summary of what types of control actions were identified in this plan. There, there are 29 of them. And each of those actions have different pros and cons. And so rather than say, we want this one or we want that one, uh, we summarize them based on those pros and cons. Those include things like the magnitude of the pathway. How easy is it to get to the river, for example, or reduction efficiency? How easy is it for us to, how easy does that, how easily does that control action actually reduce PCBs? Cost. You can spend a lot of money in high cost treatment. You could spend less money in avoidance. Implementing an entity. Is there somebody who has the regulatory authority or can implement that control action? Pollution prevention hierarchy. Where does it fit on that triangle that I just showed you? Ancillary benefit. Is there another benefit to this that this control action could have? Um, as an example, if you are removing something with a treatment technology, with a membrane technology, are you also removing another pollutant that you need to control? Is there an overlap with um, existing efforts? Do we Are we double duting something or can we take advantage of those existing efforts? Time frame for implementation. How quickly can you get that control action on the ground? And the last one, the time frame for response, how quickly will you see response in the environment? So when you look at this chart, you see that there is no specific control action that sticks out as, hey, this is the one, this is the magic bullet. But you can see that there are a few, such as managing stormwater or wastewater treatment that, um, that we can deal with in terms of magnitude of pathway, or there's a few such as um, compliance with PCB regulations, support of green chemistry alternatives, where we're dealing at the top of that pyramid, for example. Okay, so how do we know it's working? One of the things that ecology had to do was to uh, identify whether or not the task force was making measurable progress. And we did this twice. We have currently just finished our second evaluation. We define measurable progress as the three things. Are we working together? Is the task force working? Have they, are they putting money and time into this effort? Is the task force doing things? Are there reports, studies, um, are PCBs being reduced? And are we seeing those results? Are we seeing those environmental outcomes? In the MOA from the task force, if if uh, it doesn't make measurable progress, then we we ecology 
are obligated to proceed with the regulatory action, such as a TMDL. So in both cases, we uh, both times we did the evaluation of measurable progress, we found that yes, indeed, the task force was making measurable progress. The first time we did the evaluation, we really focused on the functionality of, of the group itself. This time we looked um, more in more depth at the environmental impacts. What we found is that um, for 10 years, this group has been fully funded and functional. It has um, done cutting edge work in sampling, analysis, and source identification. And it's had influence beyond its immediate um, group of people. For example, the Washington, um, Washington products containing PCBs, there were some legislative actions that happened around that. And um, a desire to petition EPA to address some um, inconsistencies in the Toxics Control Act that still allow PCBs to be entered into the environment. That's been considered by the task force. There have also been some major uh, cleanup activities. And while they weren't the purview of the task force, I would say that the task force set the stage for these to happen and to be successful. So, um, for example, Kaiser Aluminum is a large uh, manufacturing facility in Spokane Valley with PCB in the groundwater, and they're looking at new groundwater treatments, uh, new technologies that have not been tried before that not just remove PCBs, but destroy them. And uh, also, at, a couple of years ago, EPA came and did an emergency action. Uh, we had a facility that was used to film Zombie Nation. It was contaminated with PCBs, galbestos, uh, other hazardous chemicals, and EPA came and, and uh, secured that facility and removed uh, 5,000 pounds of PCBs out of that, which if they hadn't been removed would have had a, a direct um, ability to directly reach the Spokane River. So I think the last thing I wanna point out here is that when EPA um, was addressing a, a lawsuit against them over whether or not we should be doing a PCB TMDL, they set forth some milestones for the task force. And one of those was to achieve the water quality standard of 170 parts per quadrillion. And this milestone was, was met. And so even though there's a, there's a theme out there or a, a maybe people have said, Spokane is the most polluted river in Washington state. That is a statement from probably 30 years ago, because the fact is that the river is and has been getting cleaner. And we have seen that result, um, both in decreases in fish PCB concentrations of fish tissue, but also in actual concentrations in the water. So where do we go next? Um, EPA uh, settled a lawsuit uh, regarding whether or not ecology should have prepared a PCB TMDL, and they agreed to do this TMDL by uh, 2024. So when that's done, ecology will move on to creating a PCB TMDL implementation plan. As you can imagine, this changed the value proposition for the task force. And so as a result, the task force is now discussing uh, whether or not to sunset. And um, those conversations are leading to the thought that these activities will cease within the next year. And so we're currently engaged with the task force in transition planning. I think I want to um, make one other point, and that is that for, for many of us, the real problem with PCBs is that it is, they are persistent, they are everywhere, and their lifespan is far longer than our common legislative planning, permitting, even career lifespans. We can clean up the Spokane River, and I believe we will. It will take a lifetime. It will take a lifetime to do that. And so that is often hard in public processes to have that long-term look and to keep that long-term look. And so I wanna put this thought in your brain 
You know, how many of you will have your grandchildren say, I wonder what happened when and why is it like that today? So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Dave Dilks and um, thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Really appreciate your perspective. Sorry for the technical issues there. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's a good thing I practice it because uh, half of what is written down, I didn't say. So good thing. I'm sure people have lots of questions and feel free to pile them on. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, please feel free to put uh, questions in the, the chat. And if anything Adrian uh, said resonates with you for some larger comments, go to that mural site and pop it in there. Right, thank you. All right, Dave, we can see your presentation there. Great. Thank you, Adrian, for that lead in. Thank you for working the kinks out of the screen sharing. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some of the technical perspectives that go along with the regulatory perspective that Adrian just gave in Spokane. I'm going to talk first about historical status of PCBs prior to the formation of the task force, um, where, the, where things stood when the task force started, then talk about the task force technical activities, then wrap up with some takeaway messages and future challenges. So. First, we'll talk about historical PCB status prior to the formation of the task force. Uh, Washington Department of Ecology had done quite a bit of work um, on Spokane, filed a lot of information. Got some of that summarized here. On the left, we have total PCB and fish tissue at two locations in the, in the Spokane area, Plants Ferry and Nine Mile. Um, you can certainly see the presence of a problem. PCB concentrations were orders of magnitude above the Washington standard. Um, so that was PCBs in fish in the 1990s. Ecology also um, measured PCBs in the river in the early 2000s. Um, this is various locations working from upstream to downstream, the Idaho-Washington state line, downstream to Long Lake or Lake Spokane. Um, three different month-long deployments of semi-permeable membrane devices. So these are concentrations during three different periods, October 03, February of 04, and April of 04. At that point, um, coming out of Idaho, concentrations were in compliance with the um, National Toxic Rule Standard that was adopted by State of Washington of 170 picograms per liter. But as we got through in, in, into the Spokane industrial area, we see concentrations increasing and going above the 170 picograms per liter. Um, note this is piece, dissolved PCBs. One thing that makes Spokane unique from uh, just about any other PCB site that I've dealt with is the fact of very low particulate organic carbon, total organic carbon concentration in the water, total organic carbon concentration on order of one milligram per liter, particulate organic carbon, sometimes not detectable, but generally on the order of a tenth of a, micro, of a milligram per liter. So for most systems, if you want to track the PCBs in the river, you follow the solids. Spokane is quite unique in that given the low organic carbon content uh, of, of the river itself, that more than 90% of the PCBs are in the dissolved form. So one of the unique things that uh, we'll talk about as we go through the Spokane story. Also part of Ecology's work, they did an initial system-wide loading estimate and created this loading pyramid here that I'll walk through. Uh, hopefully it may have it make sense. So the arrows coming in from the right and left were our external loads to the river, Kaiser Aluminum, Liberty Lake, Wastewater Treatment Plant, Inland Empire Paper, each of these, and as long as these other arrows here, are discharges to the river where Ecology measured effluent concentrations, took discharge flow and calculated a mass load in terms of milligrams per day. The numbers inside the triangle are concentrations or loads in the river itself, where they measured PCB concentrations multiplied by river flow. So this loading period is how much is pyramid is how much is coming in to the river, and then how much do we see in the river itself? And their conclusion was, would we sum up all of the external loads um, going into the river and then look at what's in the river at the downstream end, we're only accounting for 43% of the total load. So look to be substantial missing load from, from the known sources in terms of what was actually seen in the river itself. So that was a little bit of a backdrop <clears throat> um, of work that was done prior to the formation of the task force. Um, so now we'll, we'll talk about the task force technical activities. They largely flowed from the mission statement from the task force. I won't read the whole thing here. You can, you can read it yourself, but I will 
show the three underlined areas or sort of drove the technical fact, technical focus of the task force. Um, first goal, characterize the sources of toxics in the Spokane River, so where are PCBs coming from? Uh, second aspect, identify and implement appropriate actions. That's the comprehensive plan Adrian talked about. And then finally, make measurable progress towards meeting state water quality standards. So as I go through the task force work, it's going to fall into one of these three categories, categor characterizing the sources of PCBs, identifying and implementing appropriate control actions, and determining whether reasonable progress has been made. So that is going to comprise, we want to talk about technical activities. Again, characterized sources shows up at both in step one and step three, as for reasons we'll see. Step two, develop the comprehensive plan. And then finally, support status and trends assessment. So we'll walk through each of these one by one. So first piece, characterizing the sources of PCBs. Um, this was initially done via a mass balance approach. Um, similar to what ecology had done, but at a higher level of spatial and spatial resolution supported by more data. So what you do is measure flow and concentration of known loading sources and load in the river, similar to what ecology had done. Um, convert that into a load, flow times concentration equals load. So essentially you measure the load coming into a segment of the river, and I've got the river flowing from right to left is because the Spokane River flows from east to west, and that sort of resonated in people's minds. So we measure at any given river segment, upstream concentration and upstream flow, convert that to a load, go down to further downstream reach, measure at downstream concentration, downstream flow, convert that to a load, and use that to back calculate what we're calling an unmonitored load. So for a case of an example, if, if one of the reaches, we measure an upstream load of 30 milligrams per day based on observed flow and concentration. Downstream segment, we measured 50 milligrams per day. Look at the difference between those, and we would deduce that we have an unmonitored load of 20 milligrams per day coming into the system. Um, this was done on a short enough, short, short enough section of river reaches that the residence time was short enough that um, decay processes were concluded not to be important. Um, it helped that PCBs were in dissolved form, so settling was not a big loss process. The only concern was volatilization, and the reaches were short enough that they did not look to have an appreciable effect on the load. So you can expand this approach to where we do have loads coming in the river. Um, say we have a treatment plant coming in, so we take that example. The upstream end, we measured 30 milligrams per day. Downstream end, we measured 50 milligrams per day, but we also have a treatment plant discharging 15 milligrams per day. You can do the math, 50 minus 30 minus 15, and we could deduce that there's an unmonitored load of five milligrams per day. So three different years in the task force existence conducted detailed synoptic surveys to apply this mass balance approach over a number of reaches along the length of the system. So the first one was done in 2014, week-long survey with daily concentrations measured, starting from the beginning of uh, Spokane River, which is the outlet of Lake Coeur d'Alene, going down to Nine Mile Dam. Um, reaches were defined wherever there were flow gauges, the squares are where there were point source discharges. So that mass balance approach was applied at all of these reaches from Lake Coeur d'Alene outlet down to Nine Mile Dam. And looking at the five major reaches, um, again, working right to left upstream to downstream, the conclusion we went to say, are there any unmonitored loads entering the river um, besides the ones we know of from the point sources and tributaries? From Coeur d'Alene to Post Falls, Coeur d'Alene down to Post Falls, look not to be any. Post Falls to Green Acres, Post Falls here to Green Acres, very little. And sticking out like a sore thumb, look to be a big unmonitored load between Green Acres and uh, Trent Avenue Bridge, uh, which is where it contains the Kaiser facility. Next reach, essentially no load. Next reach, essentially no load. So just doing this strictly on a deterministic basis looked like there's an extremely large load coming in between Green Acres and Trent Avenue. Recognizing the data are noisy, we didn't just trust a single point estimate. We did some uncertainty analysis, looked at the variability in the data, converted that into statistical frequency distributions. So the conclusion there was certain things we could say pretty clearly, other things weren't quite as clear. For example, the reach from Coeur d'Alene to Post Falls, this is a frequency distribution on the bottom left of estimated unknown or incremental load in terms of milligrams per day. 
had a central tendency around zero. So what, that's why we concluded there was nothing coming in. <clears throat> Recognizing the uncertainty in the data that said there could be a loss up to 45 milligrams per day, could be a gain up to 45 milligrams per day. Couldn't conclusively say whether a load was coming in, but the central tendency looked to be around zero. Conversely, the load where we did see, um, at least from our point estimate, a big load coming in, uh, had a central tendency around 150 to 180 milligrams per day. Um, there was quite a bit of spread, but the conclusion was, even given the uncertainty in the data, we could say with 95% certainty that there was a load of at least 30 milligrams per day coming into that reach. So, looked pretty clear that there was a load coming in um, in the reach that contained the Kaiser facility with the contaminated groundwater. Um, to confirm that finding that, uh, that that load was entering and impacting the river, uh, additional synoptic surveys were done in 2015 and 2018. Um, tweak the reaches to answer some other questions that we don't have time to get into. But the thing we saw both in the 2015 and 2018 load was consistently a load coming in in the vicinity of the Kaiser plant above and beyond from what their wastewater effluent was, was a load on the order of 150 milligrams per day. Here's another uncertainty analysis. Um, can't say exactly what it is, but for 2014, 2015, and 2018, the conclusion was there was always a noticeable load coming in there and that central tendency was roughly around 150 milligrams per day. So the mass balance assessment in, in this aspect was important in identifying, yes, there is a load coming in beyond anything we're measuring. It's a, it's a fairly major load and it was attributed to groundwater at the Kaiser facility. So that was the first pass of characterizing sources of PC. We, PC, we did a, a, a broad pass there and then we'll go into more detail later. Second role of the task force, as Adrian talked about, was develop a comprehensive plan for PCB control. Um, so the comprehensive plan was required to contain a source assessment. What are the PCB sources? What control actions do we have? Their cost and efficiency, Adrian showed that table. Come up with an implementation plan defining what practices to put in place and then identify future studies to fill identified data, data gaps. So just quickly walk through what came out of the comprehensive plan. Um, first thing is for the source assessment, where are the PCBs coming from? Majority of the load was coming from five sources. Um, the groundwater load near the Kaiser facility that the mass balance assessment had identified. Um, somewhat surprising, the second largest load of the system was what was coming in upstream from Lake Coeur d'Alene. Concentrations are very low on the order of 30 picograms per liter, but you combine that with a very large flow coming out of the lake, that turned out to be a non-trivial mass loading to the system. Other major loading sources were the two industrial wastewater treatment facilities and one of the municipal facilities. One thing here unique from the Puget Sound example that you don't see is stormwater is, is a major source. It actually came in sixth place. It's another unique aspect of the Spokane River area. Most of the municipalities do not have direct stormwater discharges. The stormwater gets collected in dry wells and swales and dry wells and does not directly discharge to the river. So the city has some stormwater discharges, but in the grand scheme of thing, that was not one of the major sources of PCBs to the river. So in terms of identifying control actions, um, talking about each of the each of the major sources. Um, the, Groundwater loading near the Kaiser facility, as Adrian mentioned, there's a cleanup going on. They are treating the groundwater before it uh, enters the river under a consent order. Um, second largest load upstream Lake Coeur d'Alene. There's nothing being done there, and that's that's going to be a much tougher nut to crack since the watershed above that is largely undeveloped. So this is going to be atmospheric deposition and snowpack that is contributing that PCBs. And then in terms of the wastewater facility, they are either have installed or are in the process of installing next level of treatment, tertiary treatment, um, to remove certainly at least any of the particulate forms of PCBs. So the comprehensive plan did identify controlled actions that are now being implemented. So I mentioned that the first pass of the characterizing the sources identified the major sources and quantified what was coming in from each of the point sources identified the groundwater load near Kaiser, uh, but there was more to be done in terms of secondary size loads. Um, a lot of this was driven by work that the Department of Ecology did in 2018 and 2019, measuring PCBs and biofilm throughout the study area from the Washington-Idaho state line down to Nine Mile Dam. 
Um, what they found, interestingly enough, this this area right here I've circled in red at the upstream end of the city of Spokane, called the Mission Reach, both in 2018 and 2019 had PCB concentrations in biofilm markedly higher than anywhere else in the system. So we'll take a plot out of the ecology report here, if I can get my screen to advance. So this is total PCB concentration in biofilm on the y-axis. And we're going upstream to downstream, east to west or right to left, so state line here down to Nine Mile Dam. That area I had circled in the middle of the map, the Mission Reach, we can see both in 2019, the orange bars, and in 2018, the blue bar, had drastically higher PCB concentrations in the biofilm than we saw either upstream or downstream. A little bit surprising in that it was not correlated to the water column data. The water column PCB concentrations were not appreciably higher or lower here than they were upstream or downstream. But it was consistent with historical fish tissue data that showed fish collected from this mission reach tended to have higher PCBs than in other sections of the river. So something was going on there, but it wasn't showing up uh, immediately in the water column. So in terms of identifying the source of that, um, task force identified five potential explanations of why the biofilm there was contaminated, even though we weren't seeing it in the water column. Um, potential explanations, maybe it was legacy sediment contamination from historical sources. Although the river is very sediment poor, there wasn't a lot of sediment deposits there to be containing that contamination, but that was one potential explanation. Second, second explanation of where this biofilm contamination came from was potentially buried PCB containing objects, drums of industrial waste, piece of transformers. Um, third potential explanation, that reach was characterized by having a lot of artificial bottom fill, concrete and brick material. And the thought was maybe that's where the PCBs were coming from, contaminated caulks on bricks were then put into the river to serve as artificial bottom fill. Maybe that was an explanation. A lot of historical industrial use in the watershed, the thought was potentially contaminated groundwater or potentially contaminated stormwater. So the task force has been going down each of these paths, um, looking to see which of these might be explaining the PCB contamination in the mission reach. In terms of buried PCB containing objects, they conducted an object deter detection survey with a magnetometer to look for the presence of buried metallic objects. Um, they did find some buried metallic objects. This summer, they went out and collected sediment and biofilm uh, samples in the direct vicinity of those objects. We haven't gotten the lab data yet, but that should identify, rather than digging up the bottom and trying to find the objects, um, not knowing whether the PCB containing or not, seeing whether we're seeing a PCB signal where we're seeing those objects. In 2021, sampling was conducted of the concrete and brick from the river bottom to see if it was artificial fill that was causing the contamination. That came back quite clean, so that's been ruled out. Contaminated groundwater um, is still being investigated, historical source assessment, additional monitoring going on there. And then last, there is one stormwater, small stormwater basin in the vicinity of this contamination. So catch basin sampling has been done there. And that was an area identified by Jasper, the PCB detection dog, um, similar to what you heard uh, in the Puget Sound example. So that's the continued source identification right now. The major point sources and one large groundwater source has been identified. There's still a question of what's causing the biofilm contamination in the mission reach and work is continuing in that regard. And the last piece that I'll talk about is status and trends assessment because the other goal of the task force was to show measurable progress in terms of achieving water quality standards. Um, so looking at just a couple snapshots of, of recent data over time, at least going back to 2005, as, as Adrian said, the data do suggest that concentrations are decreasing. Um, what I would say suggest as opposed to demonstrate conclusively, because if you look, there's a lot of noise in the data. Um, PCV concentrations are down where near the level of blank contamination. Um, we don't have per perfect measurements. You can fit a linear trend through this is water column concentration data from 2014 to 2018. You do see a trend, but there's also not a lot of statistical significance to it. Looking at fish tissue at different locations in the river, 2005, 2012, 2020. Um, again, you see what looks to be a trend in concentration data, but you then also look at the size of the error bars and it's tough to say anything statistically significant yet. 
especially since the data have not always been consistently collected and analyzed. Older fish tissue data were multiple species of various ages. Um, so it's tough to say anything definitively when we were comparing 12 year old fish to two year old fish. So in terms of make, assessing measurable progress and trend, attest, trend, attestment, ah, trend assessment, um, the task force in 2020 started a consistent sampling program to support that future trend assessment. So from late summer 2020 into spring of 2021, did a first round of deployment of semi-permeable membrane devices, leaving them out there for a month at a time during three different seasonal flow regimes of the year. Um, so we had got the 2021 data as our baseline data point. Uh, monitoring is going on right now. We just completed the second flow condition of 2022-2023. So we've done late summer 2022 and winter of 2022-23. There's still high spring, high flow of 2023 to be done to draw that conclusion. And then for fish tissue trends, they can settle on a consistent method of looking at year old or juvenile red band trout. Um, so we're taking out the age issue. We're looking at a single species. Um, sampling was done up and down the river to give us a baseline in fall of 2020. Sampling was then repeated in fall of 2022 and we're waiting on the lab results there. So. We've got with the one baseline data point for water column and fish tissue as part of a consistent monitoring program. The data has been or is being collected for the second year, um, but there is a status and trends program in, in place now. For hopefully, that continues on in the future. So, just by way of wrap up with takeaways and then future challenges as the task force sunsets and this goes turns over to EPA for the TMDL. Um, four takeaway messages. Uh, mass balance assessments can be effective. Smaller sources difficult to define. Trend assessment requires a lot of data and attaining water quality standards will be challenging. I got just a sub bullet to add on each of these. Uh, so first mass balance assessments can be effective in identifying PCB sources. I've pretty conclusively identified the groundwater near Kaiser as being a major source of the river. So these can be effective with the caveat if the source is large enough. <clears throat> Just as a rule of thumb from what we saw in Spokane, you needed to see a river concentration increase of about 30 micrograms per liter from an upstream segment to a downstream segment to conclude that you had a new source coming in as opposed to just being noise in the data. So mass balance assessments can be effective if you can come up with short reaches where freight processes are not significant and you have a large enough source. Um, second point, smaller sources are more difficult to define. Um, so sort of an ax with the mass balance assessment of big sources are coming in, that was effective to define it. Um, biofilm monitoring may be more of a scalpel as opposed, as opposed to an ax, because it can identify sources not found in the water column sampling. Although we've identified the presence of a source with the biofilm monitoring data, we still haven't tracked down exactly what that source is. Uh, third takeaway take message, trend assessment requires a lot of data. Um, data are noisy. Back when the concentrations were around 200 picograms per liter, the signal in the river column was above the noise or the, the noise that we're getting from blank contamination from our water column sampling. As concentration decreases, that signal is starting to submerge into the noise, which is why semi-permeable membrane devices are being employed to get rid of that blank contamination issue. Um, but regardless, these data are naturally noisy and to say anything about a trend is going to require a lot of data, a lot of data points and, and a lot of years. And then finally looking ahead as the task force goes away and, and EPA takes over and does the TMDL, I, I see some challenges in terms of now that the water quality standard has dropped from 170 to 7 and perhaps down to 1.7. Um, first feasible level of control for unidentified sources. The, Treatment plants have put in tertiary treatment. They're re removing essentially all of the solids that is getting, ready, getting rid of the solids bound PCBs, um, but it's not a remedy for getting rid of dissolved form PCBs. So um, how treatment plants are gonna implement processes to get down to meet a set water quality standard of seven is, it strikes me as quite a challenge. Also upstream Lake Coeur d'Alene, we've got 30 picograms per liter coming in from our upstream background source with just atmospheric deposition as, as the source of that load. Um, how that's gonna be reduced is gonna take decades and, and not immediately implemented. And then as a, looking, trying to meet a water quality standard of seven or 1.7, 
we found the big sources. There's a lot of small sources. It won't take a lot of PCB to um, cause an exceedance of a water quality standard or seven or 1.7 picograms per liter. So task forces made some initial steps, identified big sources, started addressing them. Actually going further down to meeting the new water quality standard strikes me as, as being extremely challenging. So at that point, I think I've talked enough. Uh, we'll open the floor for questions. I haven't been able to see the chat, but uh, hopefully we, we can hear what, what comments came up in chat, if any. Yeah, thanks, Dave. And, and thanks again, Adrian, for the two, two great talks of a very different system than our, our first talk. Um, so we do have some time for questions here. And, and one, Dave, that's um, come up has to do with uh, sort of hydrologic regimes of the river and how that might have impacted, you know, your assessments in, in mass balance measurements. And so I'm just wondering if you could touch a little bit on the hydrology of the river itself and um, some of the sampling that captured that. Well, there's a couple of different, I'm not sure what, which aspect of the hydrologic regime you're going at there. I guess it would be, I guess it would be the fact that you're dealing with a system that has seven dams on it. And so, you know, it, it's not a run of the river. It's, you know, it's controlled. So you've, but at the same time, you do have a higher flow regime and a lower flow regime to the to the system. So just a bit of description maybe on. on yeah, so there's that, that aspect of it. And then there's the other aspect that Adrian mentioned in terms of it's losing and gaining in various portions. So there's sections of the river where you lose half of the flow to the groundwater and then it reemerges as you go into, into a further downstream segment, which posed some challenges to the mass balance assessment. Fortunately, what we saw was that where we did see the load coming in was not a dam affected segment. So that didn't affect that conclusion. The, the other aspect is there are certainly seasonal vari variations in flow. Where we did the mass balance assessment, it was at summer low flow conditions. So we were looking at dry weather sources. Um, when we did the comprehensive plan, there was an independent assessment done based on stormwater sampling done by the city of Spokane, which is the only entity with appreciable stormwater discharges. So there was a bit of an apple and orange piecing together of unknown low point source loads from wastewater treatment plants and tributaries um, during summer conditions, matching that with stormwater loads um, that were coming during wet weather periods. Then I guess the, the last piece to add where the, the seasonal SPMD monitoring is coming in is trying to give us a more time integrated estimation of concentration. So deploying the canisters out there for a month during the three different flow regimes, the summer low flow, August into September, where the river's at its lowest flow, and then another month into around January, where the river's at a moderate winter flow, then again in the spring in April through May, where we're river's at its highest flow. That's going to be giving us, we did that once in 2020, and again this year, that'll be giving us data across a broader spectrum of flow regime than most of the grab sampling, which has been done at summer low flow. So I don't know. That hit on exactly what you want, but that's some of the hydrologic. No, I think that I think that does a good job of covering the the initial question. I think what I'll do too is put the link to the comprehensive plan in the chat, um, so people can get into some of those details more than themselves. Um, there's also a couple of questions about the biofilms, and Brandy Aaron Miller from my group has answered those. She's the lead author of that study, and I'll I'll probably put the link to that report um, in the the chat as well. Um, Adrian, oh, there you've popped in. So Adrian has put the link in for the comprehensive plan that's actually through the, the regional um, toxics task force website, which is a pretty good clearinghouse of, of everything that that group has done. Um, but Adrian, there was a question just about, you know, the formation of that group. And so I'm wondering if you could maybe um, just yeah. give a bit more detail on how it sort of came to be and how the you know what was the memorandum of understanding and agreement, agreement yeah yeah so um in 2010 um ecology had completed a dissolved oxygen tmdl for the spokane river and it was quite quite a complicated TMDL, involved a lot of modeling, a lot of understanding on phosphorus, how it moves through the river, et cetera. And it had been hotly contested for almost 20 years. Um, 
and so, and a lot of legal actions and a lot of not making any progress on the problem during that period of time. So the people who worked on that realized that there, there could be a better way. And it included not just the permitted community, but also the environmental community and some and somebody associated with the Center for Justice and Gonzaga Law Institute. And so they they did some shuttle diplomacy and talked with all the different parties about this concept of setting up a collaborative group. And, and um, out of that shuttle diplomacy, this memorandum of agreement was developed. It has in it, um, and I'll, I'll share a link here, but it has in it collaborative principles, consensus building, transparency of action. And it also has some very specific actions that are very similar to what one would do if one was doing a TMDL. And so the idea was if this group could come together and make these reductions or find a way to bring the river into compliance with the water quality standards, then that, that would either mean we got there and we don't need a TMDL or in our process of prioritizing, because obviously the state can't do all TMDLs and all listed waters all at once, we don't have enough resources, we could say that this priority for this work is going to be this direct implementation priority. So that, you know, Ecology really supported that. Um, and it was challenged. It was challenged by the Sierra Club. It was challenged by the Spokane Tribe. And uh, ultimately, the Riverkeeper also uh, felt that we should do a TMDL because that's a traditional approach for um, for getting to clean water. And so ultimately, EPA accepted that and decided they would do a TMDL, which is where we're at 10 years later with um, some of the actions in that task force starting, starting to wind down because of that. So um, hopefully that explains the question. Um, yeah, any. I think, you know, I think one of the other aspects, too, is that, you know, a number of these um, groups that are participating in the task force are permitted dischargers to the river. Right. So, um, you know, their their permits, it's not like their permits were, um, I don't know, they didn't go on hiatus. They they were incorporated into this collaborative effort, too. Yeah. At that time in 2010, we were also writing permits. Um, and so... The task force was included in that. It was all part of that shuttle diplomacy. It was a little bit before my time, but those actions were included. Everybody agreed at that time that that was what what should happen. Um, there are there are outs for that, and as we're going through our next round of permitting, there's this ability to move out of the task force into another type of advisory um, situation. So. Um, yeah, it still remains voluntary in that sense, um, but we do have it included in the permits um, for the purposes right now of, of enabling a transition as, as we move into this more traditional TMDL environment. Yeah, great. Well, I think we're pretty close to time here. So um, Dave, could you stop sharing your, your screen? And then I think we are transitioning into break here. There's a, there's, a couple of other comments, Adrian and Dave, in the chat. I wonder if you wouldn't mind scrolling through and if there's anything you. Yeah, I just I just responded to one of them. Right, great. Um, so um, I feel like I don't have the agenda. I feel like we have ten minutes set aside for break. Is that fifteen minutes? So um, eleven thirty now. We're gonna resume at 11.45 Pacific, 2.45 Eastern. Um, I would encourage everybody, if you haven't already, to take a look at the mural site that we're trying to use to collect and um, synthesize sort of comments and thoughts and you know responses to some of the questions that we've put in that, that mural. Um, that mural board is gonna stay open through today, tomorrow, and probably for um, a week after this. So there will be additional time if thoughts come to you. Um, so with that, I think unless some of the other organizers have anything to add, we could probably transition to break um, and rejoin at 11 or 1145. Everybody. Um...
Thank you, Andy. Um, my name is Joel Baker. I'm also at the University of Washington Puget Sound Institute. Thanks to all of you for participating. We're moving now east into the Great Lakes region, and I my job is to introduce the speakers who I hope are online. And Andy just closed the screen I needed, so let's do that. <laughs> So I assume we're going in order. Brian, we have Brian Linnell and Mark Loomis from the, from Glenpo Great Lakes National Program Office. And without further ado, Brian, if you're ready to share your screen, we can jump over to you. Hey, Joel. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm trying to find the share screen setting on Zoom. Oh, I found it. Okay, sorry about that. Um, So let's, let me make sure that this is going. Yeah, that, that looks good, Brian. Okay, great. Um, so I'll go from here. Um, like Jill said, uh, my name is Brian Linnell. I work in the Great Lakes National Program Office um, with Mark Loomis. Uh, so we kind of have a two-part um, presentation for you guys, uh, whereas I'm going to start off by focusing on some of our long-term monitoring programs. Um, so these are long run programs, um, that we operate through our Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Um, a lot of it is focused on, you know, con monitoring contaminants within, uh, the Great Lakes watershed. Um, so we have three major ones that I will talk about, um, all of which monitor for PCBs as part of them, but it's not limited to that, uh, obviously. Um, so our first one I'll get into um, is our Great Lakes Fish Monitoring and Surveillance Program, our Integrated Atmospheric Deposition Network, and our Great Lakes Sediment Surveillance Program. Um, some of our monitoring goals to start off with uh, that we use are um, tracking health of the Great Lakes over time, uh, where we monitor legacy and emerging contaminants, so contaminants like PCBs fall under the legacy category, um, and also new ones that are gaining more interest as uh, the years go by as we're discovering new things about the environment. Um, serves as an early warning system to help figure out things we need to be prioritizing and science needs in the, in the basin. Um, we share all of our data with uh, the Great Lakes states and tribes. Um, they often utilize our um, program data in order to develop their own programs or fill monitoring holes that they need. Um, and then this also helps um, make decisions for lake specific science needs for um, intensive field sampling years. So we have five very large lakes and there's a lot to do in each of them. Uh, so this kind of helps us um, figure out some critical areas. And then we report on all this. Um, we have nearly 70 publications over the past 10 years. Um, we use these as ecosystem indicators in the State of the Great Lakes reports, which we do with uh, Canada. Um, we use, a, use this as for data, data visualization tools, and we also do um, publish technical reports online about our findings. So I uh, manage the the fish and sediment programs, but my colleague, uh, Derek Ayer, who's not on this call, um, monitors the um, atmospheric deposition program. Um, so if you do have specific questions about them offline, you're free to contact uh, any, you know, either of us um, for more answers. So okay, that'd be great. So our fish monitoring program is done um, also with, uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada. Um, I'll just be talking about the US side though. Um, so we have two monitoring stations in each Great Lake, which we sample um, for top predator fish at an even odd year basis. So for example, in say Lake Superior, we will on an even year, we'll collect samples at the Apostle Islands um, and then on an odd year, we'll collect samples at the Keweenaw Peninsula. Um, and that changes, you know, we have that rotation in each lake. Um, so we're collecting fish from every lake every year, but it switches sides basically 
um, each year. And then, um, so this work is, or all of these programs are implemented through cooperative agreements, um, through you know competitive uh, research grants that we compete out to um, various you know institutions who are interested. Uh, currently, our grantee is Clarkson University. Um, so it's led by Tom Holson, um, and there's a bunch of faculty members from various universities and institutions that help us with analyzing um, the fish data. So our current uh, cooperative agreement lasts for five years and it goes from 2021 till 2026 where we recompete these agreements. And I'm still hoping you guys can see my slide transitions. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so to talk about the structure of this program, we have we collect top predator fish um, because due to bioaccumulative processes in the lakes and the food web, um, contaminants are most expressed at things at the top of the food chain. So lake trout at all of our sites and walleye, which are only collected at the Western basin of Lake Erie because that's the only site that doesn't have ample lake trout um, for us to be collecting there. Um, and this program has been going on for a long time. Um, it's developed a lot over the years, but it has originally started in 1972. Um, and we have a full long-term archive um, where all of our old fish samples are frozen um, in a facility in Milwaukee. Um, and our primary focus are these leg legacy contaminants. However, we do have a lot of emer work on emerging contaminants um, that can be very interesting too. That's kind of beyond the PCB scope. Um, and we used to collect uh, sport fish fillets um, up until 2008, um, but then it was deemed that, you know, this data, we didn't really need to be spending the resources on it. Um, so we focus more on just our emerging contaminant stuff. Um, so this is kind of an infographic of how it works. We have the collection of the fish and then they are homogenized and grouped by age. Well, group by age and then homogenized together. Um, so it incorporates whole fish, not just edible fish tissue. So all the organs, bones and um, everything. Um, and then we send them over to our analytical partners. Um, and then we will report out on our um, the, the data that we receive from these samples. And then also before I get into it uh, and into the data, our this we have a big portion of this program is part of our cooperative science and monitoring initiative, um, which is a intensive field year focused on one lake per year. So um, in 2021, it was Lake Superior, 2022, Lake Huron, and then upcoming is uh, Lake Ontario, Erie, Michigan, and it that cycle keeps repeating. Um, so we do our CSMI work for this program aboard the Lake Guardian, um, where on these cruises we'll collect surface water, plankton, mysis, benthic organisms, um, surface sediment, all to um, do contaminant work um, on other aspects of the food web as well. And then we also collect forage fish, but since this vessel is not equipped to collect fish, um, that's done by state and tribal partners. And then, so these are some of our partners and data users. Um, partners include, you know, in Environment and Climate Change Canada, our other monitoring programs, um, EPA's Office of Water, um, and lots of people that use our data are state and tribal health departments, um, the Department of Natural Resources for various states or tribes, um, the USGS, um, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, which tracks a lot of the Great Lakes um, restoration work that's going on. And then our fish collectors, um, USGS, Fish and Wildlife Service, Michigan DNR, Wisconsin DNR, um, New York Department of Environment, um, and then Ohio EPA. And then um, our tribal partner, Glyphwick, who collects Lake Superior fish. Okay. Um, here's the list of contaminants we collect. Um, for your knowledge, 
PCBs, pesticides, PBDEs, metals, dioxins, and furans, flame retardants, um, and then emerging contaminants. Um, PFAS is a big one that lots of people know about. Um, so lots of work being done there. But for this presentation, I'll be focusing on um, PCBs. OK, so here is a plot of our um, mean total PCB concentrations um, in lake trout and walleye um, at our even year sites from 1991, well, 1992 to 2016. Um, so this are, these are bar graphs that show the overall um, you know, total concentrations going down at each site um, over time. Um, and you can see in some cases gone down the, the visual, you know, size of the bar graphs have gone down a lot. Um, and we've also done statistical work, um, to show that we do have significant, um, declines in our, uh, mean PCB concentrations. Um, uh, and by total PCBs, I, I mean all, um, the sum of all congeners. Um, in these in these fish. So here's a, a table, you know, summarizing our 2016 um, data. So for example, we have in Lake Huron, um, we have 10 composites of uh, that consist of five lake trout. And so the all of these composites put together, our mean was 355 uh, nanograms per gram. Um, and then since 1992, um, we've seen an 81% um, decline in this uh, mean value. So it is, it's definitely gone on a lot since we've start, started monitoring for this stuff. Um, next, these are the odd year sites um, in each lake. So. You can see similar trends here. Um, this time it's only lake trout. There's no walleye. Like I said, those are only collected in the Western basin. Um, so again, yes, similar trends as the other sites, um, which we, it would be interesting if they went different directions, but they are going the same way. Um, again, this table showing um, pretty high percent uh, declines in each um, in each site. And then, so we also, these are graphics I took out of our um, technical reports. Uh, we have these published online on our website. Um, we have the 2016 report covers even your sampling sites up till that date, 2017 uh, reports um, on your sampling sites up to that date. And we are planning a release of a combined 2018-2019 report uh, for the spring that will cover um, both sites in each lake. Okay, so on to the um, atmospheric deposition network. Um, this is also a cooperative agreement um, that we have granted to uh, Indiana University. And th these are a series of um, sites that they have uh, to collect contaminant information from the atmosphere. Um, again, I don't manage this program, so I hope I'm describing it as, as well as Derek would have liked me to, um, but, uh, they, it collects vapor particulate samples, um, for 24 hours a day for 12 days. Um, and then they collect per precipitation samples and these are analyzed with, um, GC, GCMS. And it's not limited to just PCBs. There's a lot of other um, contaminants that they do uh, with this. So, and I believe they're trying to perfect their methods um, to include PFAS in this as well. But here is um, some plots of from 1990 to 2015 of total PCB concentrations um, at various sites. Um, over time. And then finally, um, the Great Lakes Sediment Surveillance Program. Um, this is a program that measures 
contaminants in sediment cores and surface grabs. So we um, sample one lake bed each year per the CSMI schedule that I mentioned earlier. So for example, 2021, we did Lake Superior, then we did Lake Huron and um, upcoming we're doing Lake Ontario. So its goals are to investigate both spatial and temporal trends of contaminants. Um, spatial is, you know, through surface grabs from east to west in each lake. Um, and temporal is done through sediment cores and dating the cores with um, lead to 10 dating. And you can map um, contaminant loading through time uh, with them. So <clears throat> this is currently awarded to the University of Minnesota Duluth as of um, September 2020, and it operates in a five-year cycle uh, like our other grants do. So these are our um, survey stations in this um, these five years. So Lake Superior in 2021, we take three cores, um, one in each basin, so uh, Western, Central, and Eastern, and we have various um, surface grab sites some lakes with higher sedimentation rates, we collect a lot of samples and Lake Erie, you can see there's a lot of samples that are collected throughout the Western Basin. Um, it's also very shallow there. Um, and then in previous years, we did collect a lot more, but that's because we didn't exactly know what we were working with at the time because a decade ago when we were still, when we were originally working on this, um, we had nothing, you know, to go off of. It was the first, our first um, crack at this program, and now we've refined it a little bit, um, so we can be a little more targeted with our work. So our sample collection techniques here: um, we use a box core to collect um, surface sediments, um, where it's a thirty by thirty square. If, if you're not familiar, it's kind of like a a big rectangle, you know, that goes down and we can collect the top part of the sediment um, without disturbing the area around it or at least minimally disturbing it. Um, and then we collect this out of here and then portion it off into different subsamples for different contaminants we want to investigate. And then um, for our coring sites, we use a multi-core that collects um, about 90 centimeter um, sediment cores. Um, we, these tubes are sent down into the lake bed and then we are, we remove them from the core and then we extrude them on the, on the ship or we'll segment them off into either one centimeter, half a centimeter or a quarter centimeter segment, um, depending on how um, specific we want to get down into um, mapping them. Um, and then, like I said, we use lead to 10 dating to plot um, tem temporal contaminant distribution. So we'll pair up the um, concentrations with the dates or the age of the sediment. So again, similar contaminant list that we analyzed for as our other programs. Um, so nothing much different here. <laughs> we also do a lot of physical properties, um, so like density, grain size, um, loss on ignition, organic carbon, stuff like that too. So it's not only related to contaminants here, but that's a big focal point. Um, so this is from our old um, iteration about a decade ago. Um, so we these are spatial, spatial um, distribution of PCBs throughout the lakes. Um, you can see a lot of higher concentrations in the lower lakes, potentially because there's more industri industrialized areas there. Um, but there's a lot of data here um, that shows us the, how the PCBs are distributed through the um, surface sediments. And then here is um, the various core or a core from each lake um, with um, temporal data 
going all the way back to 1840, where you expectedly won't find PCBs. Um, and then as, you know, the industrial revolution and we discover these chemicals, it starts kicking up. And then um, as they're being phased out, you can see them um, go on, you know, start their concentrations um, starting to decline, uh, you know, up till 2022. So we will have more data on this um, as our program continues, um, but this is again, old, old piece of data from our first crack at this. So um, we're eager to continue. Um, so we have a lot to look forward to. And then I just wanna do a plug for people who might not be familiar with our, um, our data and where to find it. Um, we have our publicly available data stored on our central data exchange. Um, so cdx.epa.gov, anyone can make a, um, an account to get access because you know this is a government program and we um, allow the public to review whatever they, they would like here um, for the stuff that we're uh, monitoring. Um, and you can also find um, more, you know, more information on our website um, for different monitoring activities that you may be interested in. If you have interest in other water, water quality information um, not related to PCBs, we have um, a pretty extensive uh, website for all the work we do through our uh, GLRI monitoring efforts. Um, so, uh, with that, I guess I'll turn it over to Mark uh, Loomis, um, and then I think we'll we'll be fielding questions um, after he's done. So uh, with that, uh, thanks for your time. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, let's go ahead and, and get Mark queued up here, and we'll take the questions at the end. Hey, everybody. Um, okay. Make sure I share the correct screen. So far, so good. Turn on my video here. I might have to try. I have the same connection issues as Brian, but let's see. Um, can you guys see my slide deck? Yes. Title slide there. All right. I'm going to do a quick, I'm going to do a slide advance check here real quick. All right. We're going to go up a slide. Yeah, that, that looks good. OK, all right. I just see you learn from your colleagues. <laughs> Continuous improvement, something like that, right? Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Mark Loomis. I work for uh, EPA's Great Lakes National Program Office. Uh, as Brian was kind of doing introductions, so the Great Lakes National Program Office also has a branch uh, set of sections that does remediation and restoration. And so that's where I am currently living in terms of all my many hours a day is uh, working in continuous sediments within uh, the Great Lakes. So I wanted to talk about the Legacy Act program and some of the things that we do uh, on a very much more applied side of things. So talking about some of the remediation efforts and what type of work we do. So the Great Lakes Legacy Act is a voluntary non-enforcement program that is used to accelerate cleaning up contaminated sediments in AOCs. And the sort of the big way that it works is there's no enforcement. We actually have to go out and I call it the hustle. We go out and try and make uh, partners with folks that have interest in cleaning up contaminated sediments. And those partnerships usually are federal, state, uh, and local, but they also sometimes have tribal partnerships. And it's really a, a collaborative partnership is the way it works. I'll get into this in a little more detail, but when I introduce it, uh, within the Legacy Act, we have two kind of focuses. There's remediation and restoration. For uh, remediation, the, the program is actually able to move fast because we establish a general understanding of impairments in an area. We call them PUIs. Uh, and by doing that categorically, we don't have to do a site-specific risk assessment. We can generally understand impairments, use that, uh, as well as sampling from specific sites uh, to come up with cleanup goals. And that will allow us to advance and work through these uh, projects much faster. 
Um, another aspect of all this is when you're cleaning up contaminated sediments, you know, you always have you always have to get a permit to go replace something. Uh, and so they realized when we reauthorized, you could do habitat restoration in conjunction with it. So for a lot of these projects, and I'll show pictures and whatnot, you'll see a lot of habitat restoration going on. It's because it's a really uh, kind of good nexus for us to get restoration going. And there's also a big focus on looking at recreational opportunities and engaging with the public. So I, uh, I put up a conceptual drawing here from one of our projects in Duluth, uh, Spirit Lake, where there's a neighborhood, which actually happens to be an environmental justice community. Uh, there's a large mud flat that we are remediating. We're building on-site CDFs, uh, but there's a historic railroad. Uh, we're making regional trails. We're creating trailheads up into the neighborhoods. Uh, so there's more to these contaminated sediment projects than just remediating sediments. So uh, Great Lakes areas of concern. I wanted to put up the high impact fun visuals right away because we all need that right after lunch, right? Uh, so we've, you know, the AOC program started back in the 80s, but it's an artifact of a lot of the impacts that everyone was realizing much, much, you know, sooner than that before. So we've got Cuyahoga River catching on fire here on the right, uh, one of the kind of pivotal moments of, you know, water quality and uh, environmental protection. We've got, you know, people putting hands in the water covered up in oil and no swimming. These are, I think, all realities we're all somewhat familiar with. Uh, in the construct of the Great Lakes, though, there was a water quality agreement that was created in 1987. And it's actually a, a procedural update to a boundary water treaty in 1908. So there was actually an agreement between Canada and the United States on how are we going to protect waters between the two countries? Uh, but in the 80s, this kind of focus on the Great Lakes became so important that they updated it to become the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. And in that, they identified what, what we call areas of concern. And there's 26 in the United States, there's uh, 12 in Canada, and then five of them are binational. They're, they are a, a bordering AOC. So, uh, for example, Detroit River, right? Canada on one side, America on the other side, but it's connecting the lakes. So of those, most of them have some kind of impact from contaminated sediments. In that water quality agreement, they outlined two different things. And I wanted to give us just a little bit of architecture because us government folks get stuck in jargon pretty fast. So one is an AOC. And so the AOCs are these specific areas. And what happened was when they were making the water quality agreement, it was almost grassroots. They went to the state and local groups and said, where are the biggest problems? What are the, you know, the, the foundational impacts that you're seeing? And that's how they came up with the areas, the AOCs. And then in describing the impacts, they had a, a set of 14 different BUIs. And so for each AOC, they went through and said, okay, what are the impacts in this area? And that created uh, each AOC and its own impairments. So when we are looking at how we work in AOCs, our focus on is on removing BUIs or improving the you know, physical, uh, ecological kind of chemical impacts in order to remove AOCs off of the list of AOCs. So, and I kind of alluded to this, but how do we measure impacts, right? So, the, so these BUIs are large categorical things and, and functionally they make sense. Uh, they are slightly different descriptions for each state, but uh, restrictions on fish and wildlife consumption. You know, PCBs might have something to do with that. Not sure. Um, <laughs> there's degradation to fish and wildlife populations, uh, habitat. There's tumors and deformities. Uh, there's degradation of benthos, restrictions on dredging, plankton, uh, bird and animal deformity, reproduction problems. These are all impacts to these ecological systems that are driven by contaminated sediments. It's because of these. Uh, that we see this sort of need to address contaminated sediments across the basin. So just to put a little bit of visual context here, here are the U.S. areas of concern. So these are all AOCs. Uh, they have different statuses in terms of what's going on. So we have some AOCs where we've completed all the projects or these management actions. Uh, this would be like the sediment remediation projects or the habitat restoration projects. So every time you see a little you know, pink triangle here, that means we've done all the work we need to. Now we need to let the system recover. In between uh, completing actions and that recovery, the final step is delisting these AOCs. And so every time we see a yellow star here, we're making progress. We're removing these from that list. Um, 
So just, just to put a little bit kind of finite action to it, uh, local groups, stakeholders, and federal agencies come up with these BUI removal criteria. Out of that, they have to sit down and say, okay, what are the impacts? And from that, they say, what do we need to do? How, how can we repair the system? And that, that means they come up with a list of projects, management actions. And we fall into this implementation phase, implementing management actions. And that's really what I'm going to talk about today is these large scale sediment projects. But on the backside of that afterwards, there's a monitoring protocol. There's a, a set of needs for each of those AOCs to say, hey, we listed a BUI. Now we want to monitor and make sure that it's appropriate. We're going to remove them and then we're going to delist this AOC. So this large focus on contaminated sediments went back to the 80s well before. What we found was there are areas that are substantially impacted that fall outside the realm of Superfund or RECRA or other existing enforcement protocols. There is either no other entity that is liable that you know, could take on the expense, it's the orphan site, uh, but the risk still remains. The need to address that contaminated sediment still remains. And so uh, the Legacy Act is cost sharing in its architecture, so it's not enforcement. We have to uh, go find other partners that are vested in cleaning up these areas, industries, states, municipalities, cities, counties, NGOs. All of those have to contribute at least 35%. The projects all have to be within an AOC, and it's being done through uh, Great Lakes National Program Office. So when we started the program is back in 2002, and originally they said, okay, you'll get $50 million a year for five years. It was awesome. I wasn't around, but it was awesome. Uh, they did get the first appropriation though in 2004, they got $10 million. So once they had money in hand, the goal was let's get some money and let's start making progress. Uh, in 2008, they reauthorized it. They gave them another five years, but this time they allowed for uh, the inclusion of habitat restoration and additional abilities to do some research, to uh, work on investigating sites without that match. Uh, and then in 2016, it was incorporated into something called the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. The Great Lakes Restoration Initiative has been around since 2010, and it started with a extremely large influx of money into the Great Lakes. So it was about $475 million in 2010, and it's been about $300 million even funding since then. So uh, several billion dollars have gone into the Great Lakes. Uh, a very large chunk of that has gone into these sediment projects and habitat projects. When we look at the Legacy Act and what it's allowed to do, what it focuses on, our top priority is always remediating sediments. Uh, there's an authority called the Site Characterization, and it allows us to just go out and characterize. One of the reasons that exists is we didn't want non-federal sponsors to have to spend money finding out the problem. We would rather take their money and use it to go clean it up. And so that gives us an ability to do basically an RI. Uh, but the other things that the program covers and cost shares are feasibility studies, pilot studies, remedial design. We can include source control uh, as long as it's a source to contaminated sediment. And in addressing it, we would keep a project we would do from getting recontaminated. And then it does have habitat. So uh, there's a 35% minimum. And if you have a site where there's enforcement or some other kind of nexus, the match might go up. So for example, if your sediment cleanup is right next to a Superfund site and the partner you're working with is that Superfund liable entity, they are probably going to have to put in more than 35%. Uh, we have some projects where the match goes above 50%, right? So the industry partner puts in more than half the cost. But the goal here is we're finding those partners and we are accelerating cleanups. Um, there is a variety of other things we have to do, but um, each of these does have a, a set of match requirements financially. However, they really do rely on partnerships, working with other entities, working with groups, uh, both at a sort of local level, but also uh, various stakeholders. So in, in many of these AOCs, there's a local group, uh, like a watershed partnership or an advisory council. Uh, those are the groups we also integrate a big thing is compromise and sharing. So sharing goals, sharing costs, sharing risks. Uh, so we, we work in a collaborative realm where you have to bring everyone to the table, lay out the actual go, goals, the expectations, what does everyone need to get out of this, and then start doing these projects. 
So today, the vendor announced since 2004, we've done 35 remediation projects. That's about two projects a year. Uh, there are currently five ongoing right now this year. There's five ongoing sediment projects. To date, we've remediated 6.8 million cubic yards. Uh, the total cost right now for the program is over a billion dollars. And of those non feral sponsors, we've got um, 63 different um, non feral sponsors, which is really cool. When you think about the number of industries and entities that are, are kind of coming on board. So I want to pull up that map again and just lay out where these projects are. So, we, you know, we, the, we really saw the project and the program accelerate, right? We had our first flush of projects in the early 2000s. And then we started bringing in a couple more and a couple more and a couple more. And next thing you know, you know, we've, we've got 35 different projects that are done. And, and to that magnitude to that scale is incredible. Just for sort of a little bit of context to this group, I highlighted the AOCs where there were PCB remediation projects. Um, I didn't want to do like extra dots because it would just be extra dots again. But the sort of intent here is to show that we've had to work with every state. Uh, I think Minnesota, we have a dioxin furan in which some of the remediation approaches are similar, but uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois had a, a project uh, for PCBs, but that wasn't our program. Uh, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and then also New York. Uh, Pennsylvania didn't have a PCB project, but we got to work with them sometimes. So uh, broad spectrum, both geographically, but programmatically. So being able to balance the needs of states and how they address uh, these, these types of remediations is important. Uh, some of them have been high enough to be TOSCA. So we do have TOSCA level cleanups, and that is a fun architecture to navigate. From a execution standpoint, how we do our work, uh, we, we kind of have to go to that project concept, get back to the, the management action. We work with other project uh, programs. We look at uh, requirements that locals or states might have, and then we create a project agreement. And that project agreement is more or less a deal, right? It says EPA is going to do this, non federal sponsors are going to do that, and the whole scope of things you're going to accomplish is the project. For these, uh, we generally call them project coordination teams. And any one of these projects can take a variety of forms. You know, we almost always start out with some aspect of an RIF SRD. Uh, but at an execution side, we nearly always hire our own contractors. Uh, we, we do have, I got to give a little shout out for the RV Mud Puppy 2. Mud Puppy 2 was built uh, by our program. It is operated by us. Very, it's on, under the same contract as the Lake Guardian. But this is specifically designed as a you know a shallow vessel to be able to get into shallow waters and, and sample contaminated sediments. So we, we can take a fiber cores, ponars, um, you can lay out cores for a whole day's worth of sampling. But the vessel is specifically designed for us to do contaminated sediments. Um, so even in hiring contractors, we, we have a boat that we operate. I wanted to put up a lot of pictures about the program, but I also want to just present the breadth of how do we deal with these sites. Uh, when we look at the technologies we've used uh, and continue to use, we've got many different methods of excavation and dredging. So there's mechanical dredging where we're using uh, an excavator with a bucket and we're actually just putting it in trucks or putting it in a barge. There's hydraulic dredging where we are using a cutter head to cut up the sediments and put it in a set of tubes over to uh, somewhere where it's going to get dewatered. We've dewatered rivers. We've put in sheet pile, just dewatered the Milwaukee River and uh, excavated a bunch of material um, that also includes upland areas and then even when frozen so we got a project up in Duluth uh, here they were working in winter so they had to uh, sort of you know pull up all this impacted you know pH rich stuff and they're actually there's a cat back here behind it you can't see but um, then there's also how do we deal with it so there's confined disposal facilities uh, that have been done on site there is a, 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 a use of CDFs on site, but a lot of times it's landfills. When we are using CDFs, sometimes you can use textile tubes, sometimes it's a mechanical placement. We also have uh, in situ works so or remedial caps and remedial caps can be delivered a variety of different ways depends on your water level depends on what uh, what the actual environment is sometimes we can dewater that and do it uh, in the dry. So there's various different technologies that can be used there. Just to give a, another kind of similar process here, this is one of our projects where we were doing uh, mechanical dredging in a moon pool. 
So sometimes, you know, we're in super urban areas. Sometimes it's a, a little bit, um, a little bit more operating room. In this case, we were uh, using these curtains and moon pools to control turbidity. Uh, materials put on barges, brought over. One of the things that often has to be done with these sediments is stabilize them. Uh, in this case, we're using Portland cement. When you have those Tosca level uh, contaminant thresholds, the stabilization uh, protocols change, right? We might be adding more Portland cement. We might be letting it cure longer. Every project has its own needs, but the kind of necessity of stabilizing that material before it's disposed still remains. Another thing that's done is uh, the use of protective caps. And you know, we we think of we can think of a passive cap as really being like a cover, like a sand cover. But a lot of the caps created for our program have some type of activated uh, component. So uh, I've got a, just a quick cross section of one of the caps that we've made uh, that has activated carbon, granular activated carbon. It's around 0.75 percent, but uh, it is sand that is actually has this activated carbon uh, blended into it, and then it is placed at various thicknesses. Um, sometimes there's a root barrier on top of that, and it could be a fabric, it could be a, a textile like we see here, sometimes it's a gravel. Um, in this case, this is the Grand Calumet River, the West Branch, where they actually, uh, they actually blocked off this river and did all this in the dry. Uh, here's a, just another view. This is a telebelt. This guy actually is a remote, so he's just sitting here. He's laying out the cap with a remote, so he can get really nice, precise placement there. But in figuring out these caps, right, we have to balance what is the uh, disposition of the area when we're done? How much of this do we need to remove? Do we need to create water depth? Do we need to get rid of water depth? There's ecological needs as well as industrial needs. You know, if it's a commercial harbor, maybe we can't be capping, you know, two, three feet. Uh, so we have to think about more removal. But these are the types of uh, things we have to think through. So I'm gonna go to a couple projects here. Here's Ashtabula River uh, in Ashtabula, Ohio. Just over half a million cubic yards remuted, $60 million project. Uh, you know, when we think about habitat, this one they actually created a, a fish shelf habitat. So this is a very urban port, but they were able to create um, this nice fish shelf structure. For this project, we had to uh, excavate and, and dredge in the actual harbor and then pumped it all the way up to a disposal facility. So uh, it took a lot of coordinating with our industry partners, getting buy-in, cooperation, uh, just to move that material and get it to stay there. Here's a couple of different views. This is one of the hydraulic dredges. Uh, here's the ladder, and then there's a cutter head. Uh, there's a, a set of pumps and pipes that are used to then pump that to where it's going. Here's just a nice view. Uh, but we made progress, right? So we signed a project agreement in 2005, got the remediation done, you know, early 2011, 2012, it was done. And then we delisted it in, uh, just last year. Here's West Branch. Uh, I was talking about those geotubes. Here's a geotube that was filled up and then dried. So the best way to think of it is like a sausage casing. Uh, the contaminated uh, sediments stay inside. The water weeps out. We collect the water, we treat it. And then these sediments are, uh, in this case, they were brought off to a landfill down in Indianapolis. But we also have uh, a lot of wetland work, right? These impacted sediments you know, get overgrown or uh, uh, you know, water levels change and they turn into these uplandy areas. And so sometimes it's not just, you know, dredging sediments, we're also excavating upland areas, we're taking out wetlands and marshes and having to recreate it. Um, in this case, you know, well over 700,000 cubic yards were remediated. That means that we've removed some and we capped. We count that uh, volume underneath those caps, $70 million, 17 acres. One of the cool things about our program is, you know, we're talking a lot about remediation, but the partnerships and talking to communities and looking at how we improve things, uh, we do have an outreach program with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. They help us look at ways to interface with the community. Sometimes that means going into the schools. Um, but it, it's really cool to see how we can take actual remediation work and start creating recreational opportunities and bringing people back to the water. Uh, it's just a, such a cool dynamic. Here's another picture. This is from the Roxana Marsh Project, which is just a little, uh, I guess, kind of upstream from where the other project there was. Here's the, um, here's the Roxana Marsh covered in Phragmites. And what we actually did was we did basically what would be considered a de novo uh, project. We stripped everything down, we put in a clean cap, and then we put in native species. And so here is what that area looks like now, but it started as just a sort of a monocline of Phragmites. Here's uh, one of those school groups where those kids uh, 
they were doing a variety of different things with their curriculum, but you know, when the project got done, they got to come out and see it. Uh, they even did some, you know, kind of um, citizen science type work. Really, really cool to see that happen. Lincoln Park, this is a project in Milwaukee, it had two different phases. It is one of the projects that had Tosca level PCBs. Uh, started out as a mud flat, and uh, here it is sort of post restoration. We put in riprap, a lot of shoreline restoration and brought in water. And then here it is a couple of years, couple of years later, right? The native species are back. The uh, water is obviously cleaner because we went through and removed a bunch of the PCBs. Uh, here's just a different view, 175,000 cubic yards, $43 million, over two miles of stream bank, right? When we go into these rivers and we're able to get both sides of those streams, uh, that's a great way to restore that ecological function. Um, in this case, we were working with local parks and helping to uh, cre create that dynamic where uh, we are creating better ecological function, but also uh, recreational opportunity in these areas. Sheboygan River, Heather's on the phone. The, the uh, Sheboygan River projects are totally her thing, but I'm going to give everyone the, sort of the real quick version. Uh, Sheboygan, Wisconsin is a industrial area um, right on the west side of Lake Michigan, the east shore of Wisconsin, uh, just north of Milwaukee. And this, this AOC had lots of PCB issues. There were also uh, NAPL and PHs that needed to be addressed, but there's an interf interface with Superfund. There was uh, work done by our legacy program. And then there was also remediation work that was done outside of the legacy authorization, but still uh, continuing sediments. So just a, a whole set of moving pieces, both uh, logistically, but also just in terms of how they were addressed. So the legacy project, which is further upstream than the harbor project, uh, 24 hours a day in Sheboygan, right? We're in downtown Sheboygan here, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, just almost 150,000 cubic yards uh, processed. This was all mechanical, right? So we have mechanical uh, clam shell buckets, environmental buckets actually coming down, pick up the sediment, put it into scows, we then transport it where it needs to go. Uh, here's the Sheboygan Harbor project, uh, which is just downstream, two separate projects, uh, 24 hours a day also, 150 trucks per day carrying that material uh, out because we're obviously not going to dispose of it in downtown Sheboygan. So several months, uh, it is self just over 150,000 cubic yards. Here's a, a scow. So when you're very limited in space, how do you stage and process and work on this material? So in this case, stabilization is going on in the actual scow. So uh, the, the pug mills are, are bringing in that Portland, and then we've got long, long reach excavators actually doing that mixing. Of course, there's a whole protocol to keep everything clean, keep everyone safe, but uh, really interesting way to get these projects done. But when it's all done and said, I mean, how cool is this, right? You get a restored harbor, cleaner, deeper water, over 300,000 cubic yards, um, you know, kind of kind of able to accomplish a lot, even though it all wasn't legacy act. So as we look at sort of these projects we've gotten done and where we have to go. We've made progress in terms of delisting AOCs in the last couple of years. Um, we've made significant progress at some of these areas where, you know, if you, if you talk to someone 20 years ago, they'd be like, there's no way you could get it done, but we got all these, you know, all these continuous sediments addressed. We've got restoration going on. A lot of the partnerships uh, that we've made, it's the big reason uh, that it is getting there. Our, our management uh, as a motto of GSD, get stuff done. Um, so we've been getting a lot of stuff done in terms of uh, where we are now and what we have right now for this year, there's a $368 million appropriation under Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Um, on top of that is the bipartisan infrastructure law with another $200 million, uh, which goes through 2026. So over almost half a billion dollars for us to get work done. Uh, a large chunk of this is going to go to AOC work and a good chunk of that will go to sediments. So there's a lot of resources, but there's a lot of work to come. Just to paint a picture of how chaotic our lives are, uh, in 20 years, we got 34 projects done, about 6 million cubic yards, about a billion dollars. In the next seven years, we had to do 50 projects for 10 million cubic yards for $1.5 billion. Uh, it's exciting. It's a great opportunity. So, you know, full steam ahead really is, is sort of where our program's at. Um, the AOCs that I showed, there's lots of 
projects that are still out there. And uh, we've learned how to deal with PCBs. We've learned how to deal with PAHs. We've done fun things with, uh, you know, activated carbon, GAC, sedimites, um, things I kind of broadly call fairy dust, right? To deal with uh, near shore, shallow water uh, exposure reductions. But some of these projects are just wholesale massive. Milwaukee River, we're going to go build a a dredge material management facility to go put all of the impacted contaminated material out of Milwaukee and St. Louis River. You know, there's there's these just sort of massive efforts that have to get done. Cuyahoga River, there's a dam that's 50 feet high with another half a million cubic yards sitting behind it, and there's a waterfall in there. So we've got to remove a bunch of sediments, find a waterfall, restore the free flowing Cuyahoga River. So there's some really cool stuff. Um, but one of the things we've kind of realized is that the maintaining progress for us is federal funding from non-federal sources because uh, the Legacy Act needs that as our match. We need to have partnerships because everyone needs to work together, but it's really the multiple levels, the stakeholders at uh, local level, industries, uh, federals, uh, agencies, all working together. You have to be super flexible. Um, Buy-in at a local level is important. Uh, sustained commitment and energy. That's me. I'm your energy. Here we go. Tuesday afternoon. Um, getting investments from state agencies and then working with our contractors. Finally, if that wasn't enough, when we finish these projects, we can't just leave them, right? We, we do have to go into that infrastructure of how do we remove these BUIs, but the specific project, the Legacy Act requires that the non federal sponsor is uh, in charge of long-term monitoring and maintenance. And there's a plan that is made at the end of these projects and it outlines what has to get done. Uh, so we collaborate as these projects wind down and sometimes even at the front side, as we're trying to figure out what is the remedy. Um, and that long-term monitoring and maintenance is no release of liability, right? So if a, a entity comes to us and says, hey, we want to do this project, uh, they see it as an opportunity to reduce their potential liability, but in doing these projects, it doesn't absolve them of anything. So it's a, a voluntary effort through and through. Um, and then I'm going to say questions and comments. I know it was a lot of talking and I, you know, I didn't know how much time I would have. So I hope I was able to get through all that. But now everyone's brains both hurting, but also excited, right? Great. Thank you, Mark. And right on time. So no problems. <laughs> we do have time for a couple of questions, I think, before we take We'll move on to the next thing on the agenda. Um, it looks like you've covered many of the questions I saw. Andy James, you had a question about Superfund. Do you want to jump in on that one? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Joel. And thanks, Mark, for the talk. It um, you you addressed this somewhat, but just kind of curious about how you coordinate with Superfund. And you said there's Tosca, referred to, uh, Superfund and Tosca and and your cleanup program, like they might all be operating in coordination question mark and so just some maybe a little bit comment about how you guys approach that um it's going to be site specific right and it'll also depend on the state we're working in but uh at a sort of functional level usually what happens is someone knows about the contamination right so either uh, the aoc knows about the contamination and industry knows about the contamination or a state someone knows about it and maybe all of them do um and in, in that light, part of the project may already be getting covered under Superfund, right? If there was no legacy program, if there's no AOC, it would still be a Superfund site. If there is a project that is under an administrative order of consent, we can't do work there. We can do work in addition to it, right? We could do work next to it. We could do something called a betterment, but we can't do the actual work under consent orders. With uh, a specific site where the contaminants are high enough that you're interfacing with Tosca. Project still is, is, you know, Tosca waste. It still has to be handled as Tosca. So we coordinate with our Region 5 Tosca folks. And in some cases, when we had a project in Buffalo, we talked with Region 2. Uh, but the Tosca process stays the Tosca process. The Superfund process stays the Superfund process. So we touch them, right? We work with them, but we don't, we don't sort of wholesale take over. Everyone stays in their lanes. Thanks, Andy. Did that answer your question? Maybe. <laughs> that was helpful. Yeah, yeah. Consider, yeah, thanks. Great. Okay. And um, 
Maybe one more question. It just, it just popped up. Have you done any beneficial use of contaminated sediments to minimize the cost versus offsite disposal? Can you say a little more about that. Yeah. So the Great Lakes Great Lakes Restoration Initiative is expansive. So many things that have been done. Uh, for legacy projects, we usually do not do much beneficial use because it is so contaminated. Our focus is limit exposure and get it out. Uh, Duluth, though, you know, in Duluth, they've got a massive horse trading of, of sediment where they're taking some sediment material out of the harbor, bringing it over to a CDF and other materials coming in from CDF to build another island. So there are very intricate beneficial use projects that are being done. Uh, but yeah, uh, Cat Island, we used beneficial use material to create new CDFs that turned into shallow islands. Um, just all kinds of cool things that are getting done. So yeah, beneficial use is it's like its own fun thing in the Great Lakes world. Great, thanks. Thank you. If you could stop sharing your screen, I think we're going to do, we have about 15 minutes. We have a couple things planned for you all. Thanks for hanging in there. I know it's it's either lunchtime or mid-afternoon nap time or bedtime if you're if you're Steve Eisenreich in Brussels and Steve's still on. Um, but we'll try to, try to move on here. Um, what we have in mind, I've been taking notes and trying to get some thoughts together on some of the common themes, and we'll see how how bad I am at sharing my screen now that I've seen how bad you are at sharing your screen. Let's go here. See if that works. These are very much my initial thoughts on this, and this is just meant to give you something to go home with, and hopefully, Mario, you're going to tell me if I'm not doing this right, but you can see my screen, right? Yes, I can. Um, so here's, and again, this is, a, this is just my own brain writing stuff down as you guys were talking, um, I, and some, some comments here. I mean, I think it, it's encouraging to me, having been doing this for a very long time, that there's good long-term data sets that were presented. And I think the long-term monitoring shows what you all know, which is relative to the 70s and 80s and 90s, the PCB concentrations in the systems are generally decreasing. Um, however, they're not decreasing at rates that we like. And I think it's an open question whether the rates of decrease are decreasing, right? Are we starting to flatten out into some sort of steady state? So I think that's an open, open question for all, many of us. Um, the remediation of hot spots, I think, has been done in, in many areas, and I suspect we'll hear more about that um, tomorrow. Um, relatively straightforward, relatively fast, and I put relatively in bold there, but it's relative to cleaning up the rest of it. Um, so I think many places have done what they can do or in the process of cleaning up the really highly contaminated areas. We just heard some good, good work out of the Great Lakes there. Um, however, I think the obvious point here is that the hot spot remediation um, helps to increase the rate of recovery, um, but is I, I'm not aware of any systems where that in and of itself is sufficient to meet the PCB targets. So it's, a, it's an important first step, but there's always more work to be done there. And as was shown in the, in the Puget Sound example, and I think I, I've seen some of this from other places, we have to recognize that the, the remediation actions themselves likely result in short-term increases of PCB levels in the water. So, Get ready for that. If you know if you're doing long-term monitoring and you get blips in your water column concentration data, it may be related to the activities that long-term will help, but short-term you know, will have some problems. Um, I think what really is the common message that we're all wrestling with is that what do we do with with the residual PCB? And here I'm defining residual meaning you know after you clean up the really contaminated hot spots, you get the barrels of PCBs out of your rivers, you have to, that kind of stuff that we've I think we've largely all done. We're nowhere near the uh, restoration goals or the the, uh, the targets, and then you know, and then what, right? So um, we've heard, and I think it's certainly fair to say that these levels, you know, will likely cause impairment for decades without further actions. Um, as David said in Spokane, and I think it's true everywhere. It's really hard to find these small sources. We're kind of getting down close to detection limits. We're kind of in the weeds and things. I I was encouraged by the use of the passive samplers and sort of more innovative sampling techniques to um, find small sources and detect these low level concentrations. Um, these smaller sources also, as was just pointed out, will require non-federal support and more, frankly, innovative approaches to the problem um, beyond what the, the, so the techniques and the, and the methodologies used to clean up the hot spots and focus sites, it doesn't work as well when you, when you have these, these smaller, more distributed sources. 
Um, Andy just asked the question about challenges about uh, CERCLA and TOSCA and sort of harmonization of the different regulatory and programmatic elements of this PCB cleanups. Um, what do we do in the case like in the Spokane River where the PCB targets um, may be approaching or be um, below the background levels? Um, you have enough upstream source at, at 30 picogram per liter and your goal is seven picogram per liter. That's a pretty tough, tough game to play. Um, and then we'll touch on a little bit with the last presentation, what alternative technologies are available to, to accelerate the PCB recovery? I don't think any of us are satisfied with the answer that it's going to take decades for this to work itself out. What other tools do we have or do we need or should we be developing to accelerate the rate of PCB recovery? So those are just meant to, this is not meant to be the, the, a complete list. It's just my thoughts, but just kind of wanted to wrap this with a little bit of what I heard from, for, as common elements across se several of the presentations. So with that, I'm gonna and I'll turn it over to Marielle, um, and who, who will land us back at the dock. Yeah, thank you, Joel, for those initial reflections. I'll just highlight uh, Rachel's comment in the chat about the importance of source tracing and control, particularly in the context of, of building materials. Um, as we wrap for the day, I'm going to go ahead and actually launch a poll. Um, this poll, in addition to what you all have already been sharing as great reflections in the mural, is really geared towards next steps for this collaboration across regions and what, as we dig a level deeper, since we're really just kind of scratching the surface and building some shared understanding and context across these regions today, um, where would be helpful to go a, a level deeper? So we'd appreciate if folks can um, share your reflections in there. Um, you should just see this pop up and be a, a straightforward multiple choice. Um, just in terms of setting the stage for tomorrow, again, we'll keep the mural open not only overnight, but um, kind of for a week after so folks can continue to chew on and, and reflect on these thoughts. Um, we will ultimately make the presentations and the recordings available. Um, we hope that all of you will be able to join us tomorrow to continue these conversations. Um, but that's also part of why we are recording all of this. Um, Adrian, I see that you have a hand raised as folks are doing the poll. Go ahead. Yeah, I just I want to bring up something that's really pretty close to dear, near and dear to me. And that is the fact that as long as we continue to allow these materials into our commerce and into our environment, we will continue to be chasing these ultra small concentrations. And so there's a tendency to go, oh, we need to go and remediate that area with this concentration because it doesn't meet water quality standards. But the fact is there are things we know and things we can do something about. And one really glaring example is the Toxic Substances Control Act still allows PCBs at up to 500 parts per million in some uh, chemicals, right? And so until we address those regulatory frameworks that allow these materials to come back into our commerce, we're going to continue to chase these parts per quadrillion, right, in our water. So just think about that. There are things we know about and things that are really difficult to deal with, but we do know where some of these PCBs are coming from, quite frankly. So thank you. Wonderful. Appreciate that call out there. I see folks are going and submitting the poll. Um, once you've answered, you don't need to do anything to submit. I see a question about that. Um, once we've got everybody's responses, I'll hit end and that'll show our results there. So I still see questions coming in. So I'll give it another 30 seconds or so. Um, I think that what Adrian just highlighted is a great example of, of the types of themes and focuses that are, we're, we're hoping to highlight in these conversations.
Okay. Um, vast majority of people have participated. So I'm going to go ahead and hit end poll. Um, really appreciate everybody's input here just to pull this up um, and kind of show you all what, what the group is seeing. Um, it looks like that in terms of sharing lessons learned, there is definitely a strong interest around both source identification um, as well as methods for, for monitoring um, in particular um, and the effectiveness of different pollution removal and cleanup methods. We also see in terms of some of the pathways that are most challenging, uh, stormwater in particular has a lot of, of focus, um, at, as does some of the others with atmospheric deposition. And in terms of, of kind of the areas of interest for this collaboration, um, looks like the lessons learned and also research findings um, thinking about how these insights translate beyond just PCB management to, to be relevant to other emerging persistent compounds. I think we heard um, the gift that keeps on giving. So how do we try and nip it in the butt um, for some of those other gifts that are emerging? And then just for our context was kind of getting a sense of who all is engaging um, in term and the relationship you have to PCB management so that as we continue into tomorrow and continue these conversations moving forward, um, we have a sense of, of what's relevant. Um, but as, Mary, yeah, Mary, are, you, are you showing results? Because we're not seeing results. Oh, to the does that go now again? Can you see them now? Yes. Yes. That, that's ah. back. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think I did a double click where I share and then stop sharing. So feel free to browse through those. We'll also make those results available. Um, and as Katrina highlighted in the mural, one of the questions is as we get ready for tomorrow, if there are any last minute tweaks that would make um, the information being shared more useful or helpful, um, please let us know there. Um, but I think at this point, Andy, or Greg, any other final thoughts? Otherwise, happy to, to let things wrap. I'll jump in here to say that this was an absolutely amazing few hours together. I know I am really affected by this. Uh, I've got pages and pages of notes, and this was exactly what we were hoping to do. So thanks so much to our presenters and looking forward to tomorrow's session and keeping the discussion going after tomorrow. Really well done to all of our presenters. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all. We will wrap things there. Yeah, I think we're all set and same time tomorrow. Uh, do we use the same uh, URL link, Mariel? Okay. Yes. When you registered, it should have generated a calendar invite that's for the both days. Um, should be same link. But if anybody has issues um, accessing, please don't hesitate to email. We'll hear about Chesapeake Bay, Delaware Bay, yes. and New Bedford Harbor tomorrow. I think you'll find it equally interesting. All right. Thank you all. Thanks, Thanks. everybody. Thanks to everyone to, who participated. <laughs>